Mm, great. I think. Uh, I. I'm just checking that I think we are live, I believe. Yes, we are live, I think. Everything yeah, so my, just... my, my screen says. Hello, yeah, go ahead. Your screen says live, correct? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think because that one says live, not, not necessarily sent to all of them. But I believe now we are live. Uh, hello, everyone. We are, uh, uh, thanks everyone for joining or the people who will see this live later. Uh, so I think we are live currently at Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and uh, Facebook. Uh, it is a great honor to have uh, Professor David Carger from MIT. I will talk about some starting story about that. Uh, and uh, today we are, I mean, talking about, uh, I mean, uh, David's life and then also research. We discuss several aspects of his research and we go through the details of that. If you have a question, uh, please, I mean, feel free to ask uh, from, uh, uh, like uh, you can ask LinkedIn, you can ask uh, in YouTube, you can ask in uh, Instagram, LinkedIn and uh, YouTube probably are the best. I will check it more often, but in Instagram also you can ask. Uh, so that's the things. And uh, okay, so uh, let me just do one last check to make sure that we are live here. So checking, yes, uh, great. Uh, okay, and then let me just turn off the things. Uh, great. Okay, so I think uh, let's uh, start. Uh, with David. Uh, actually, let me uh, tell you first, I, I don't know whether uh, David remembers that or not, but uh, my uh, one of my first experience with him actually was taking his randomized algorithms course at MIT. I think that's the course that you should take it if you go to MIT. And I don't know whether there's an online version of that or not. Lots of exercises, but that's a, just a great course. So even now, whenever I'm talking, I'm talking about some particular proof that he mentioned, the way of proving, because randomized algorithms are often, I mean, it is easy to state, but not uh, easy to prove. Generally, I mean, may need actually more sophistication. And the way that he mentioned several of these, they were actually nice, very nice. And some of this, I remember actually some of the exercise from some papers that we found that actually the solutions are there. But uh, I'm doing the same for my courses as well. So, I, uh, and that's actually great because you had a great uh, experience on that. And actually he's one of the pioneers of randomized algorithm. That's the thing that we will talk more about it. Uh, David got his PhD in Stanford from 1995 or 1994? Uh, I think technically it was 94. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think because I, when I looked at the, uh, Math genealogy, I think it was 1995, but you got the ACM actually uh, best thesis award in 1994. So I assume that should be the correct things about the randomized algorithm and the one that we are talking. And I think one thing that I like about David work is that the algorithm that he designed are very simple, but very effective. I mean, I think just two, three days ago, we were talking with uh, uh, some of I mean, my colleagues thinking about a problem and we were all talking like a Carger's algorithm for the code, should we use it or not? These are like very beautiful <laughs> algorithms, very nice and clean things. And especially if you implement, you know that clean algorithm is actually a blessing versus a very complicated algorithm. Uh, great. So I think with this uh, start, uh, we will uh, talk, by the way, he got his uh, PhD with, uh, I mean, great, uh, I think, uh, uh, person, uh, uh, Rajiv Mutmani, unfortunately, he passed away. We will talk about him. He's a, uh, like some people, they consider him actually the moral father of uh, Google and like guided at least the Google people. So we will talk about him as well to have some memories of him. Uh, great. So I think uh, with this, we want to start to say something, David. Uh, sure. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's always fun to reminisce uh, about where things came from and you know, what, what I used to do. Um, and uh, I, I hope I can provide some interesting, some interesting stories for people who are listening. Uh, great, yeah. So I think the people will listen now and 
hopefully for the future, as long as <laughs> all these softwares are there, so it is, will be saved on everything. Uh, and we have, by the way, we have a podcast as well, so if you want to do that. But we try to keep it simple, no slide, nothing such that we can. Still, we talk about technical stuff. Uh, great. So I think uh, maybe we just want to start a little bit about life. So did you want to be a scientist or computer scientist when you were a child? Uh, uh, do you want to share anything, nice things that made you essential into math, CS, etc.? Yeah, I, I think I was a pretty typical, um, typical academic uh, in, in that sense. Um, I mean, as a child, I was very, uh, very uh, introverted and uh, did a lot of reading. Um, and I sort of spent a lot of time in my own head, just thinking about things. Uh, my, uh, my grandmother actually started calling me professor when I was around seven uh, or something like that. She, that was just her nickname for me. Um, and, you know, I, I really enjoyed uh, math uh, in, and, and, and science in elementary school and high school. Um, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't in any sort of gifted programs or anything like that, but I kind of uh, sort of moved, moved ahead. I, I, I sort of... I was a, maybe a year or two ahead of the grade um, and just reading, re sort of studying math on my own um, in, in, in high school. And, and, you know, I came from a family. My, my father was, a, was an engineer and um, really, really liked math and science. And so, you know, thinking about science as a career came very naturally. Um, and it was sort of obvious from the beginning that that, that was where I was going to be going. I don't think I really had an understanding of, of academia and what it was like, what, what it might be like to be a professor until I was well into college. But certainly the, the idea of a, of a mathematical sciences career uh, was established very, very early. Uh, uh, great. Uh, so, uh, and uh, like, where did you go to uh, undergrad that I didn't find on the web? Or yeah, I, I did my undergraduate, I did my undergraduate at Harvard. Um, I graduated oh, in 1989. Um, I actually started there as a physics major. Uh, my father was a was an electrical engineer uh, or an optical engineer, and so um, I, I had thought for a long time that I was really going to um, that I was really going to enjoy physics and and major in it and, and do a career in physics. Um, but uh, I took computer science in parallel. I. I I actually came into college not with a lot of computer science uh, training. I hadn't had any courses in it. Um, I had, you know, a computer to play with at home that I didn't do anything fancy with. And I had read a few books um, about computer programming that I thought were cool. So, so in parallel with my, with my physics studies, which I thought were going to lead to a physics degree, I also took the computer science sequence. Um, and I, I sort of discovered over the next four years that physics really wasn't for me and computer science really was for me. Um, yeah, actually, I want to add to that. So you have done both in some sense because I mean, the randomized algorithms, that's actually the big part of, I mean, the physicists, at least a good part of it, they are talking about the phase transitions and other stuff. And that's somehow yeah. common area in that sense. So randomization definitely is somehow in the intersection of both, I will say. Yes, and it's actually kind of amusing for me to look back and think, about how little attention I paid to statistical mechanics when I was taking it and how poorly I understood it uh, as I an see. undergraduate because um, I, I, I hadn't made those connections yet. Um, and, and I mean, it was in, the class was at 8.30 in the morning, which was not, not helpful. Um, but just sort of the, the, the physics framing, I, I just didn't get it really. Um, and it was really only through computation um, that I that I really came to understand randomization and randomized algorithms. Uh, uh, great. Uh, yeah, but let me just one thing. So when you talk to the camera, I think the voice is better. So I think okay. the yes, I, I will try to <laughs> Yeah, uh, that, uh, uh, that is great. Okay, so uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about your family. I think you have uh, four children, and this is according to uh, Wikipedia. I have actually three, yes. and I know it's <laughs> not easy at all. Uh, and also your wife is a, a famous American uh, author. 
So I think right. uh, uh, like that actually when I was at MIT, I heard about it and oh, David Weib is actually famous uh, uh, author. So uh, can uh, have you ever contributed with her in any book or did you put any randomization, any ideas of computer science into <laughs> her book? Or? Um, I, I think our, our, our domains are quite separate. Um, I have read, I've read some drafts of some of her books um, and, and I've read her books, of course, but, um, and, and, and I think she has certainly drawn, you know, be, be, because she's married to me, she spent a lot of time with academics uh, and, and university. I mean, her, her father and mother were also academics. So she's, she's had a lot of experience with that community. Um, but I, I suspect that some of what she has observed over the years, um, you know, at lab retreats and so forth, um, and, and some of the personalities have made their way into her books, but, but only in a very digested uh, way. I don't think that she's really copied anything out of, uh, uh, you know, me or my life or colleagues. It's more of the, you know, particular traits and things that she's mixed and matched to create interesting characters. Uh, great. And uh, like, uh, have you decided, I mean, uh, what, uh, like, uh, just mention her name, I think, uh, that oh, like be, yes yeah I, 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 yeah I knew that but I didn't want to know is the Allegra Goodman uh, yeah yes. that's the thing that I didn't want to mispronounce uh, her name yeah so uh, what type of I mean a story she writes about like any type of things or so uh, Allegra writes modern American fiction um, she she her her stories have ranked very broadly she's got one quite well-known book about a um, very closed religious community in upstate New York, um, and another uh, quite well-known book about um, uh, scientific fraud in biology laboratory. She just looks for interesting stories uh, about modern life um, and, and interesting characters that she can tell stories about. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not like she's limited to a particular type, um, but just wherever the interesting stories are. Um, and she writes novels and also she publishes short stories in the New Yorker and, and, and uh, other places like that. Uh, great, so that's a nice idea to the introduction. And I think we encourage the uh, people who see that also uh, check her book. So hopefully they <laughs> like it as well. Uh, and anyhow, she's a famous uh, author anyhow. And uh, by the way, for the audience, uh, so uh, again, we are uh, live and global on several media. Sometimes I will look at my cell phone to check everything is going uh, well because I need to also make sure that the setup is correct uh, and check for questions, etc. So that's a thing that you will see that. Uh, uh, great. So I think you talk about uh, uh, like you didn't uh, say that you were a typical person for the math and CS and then became interested, I think, then to Harvard in some sense, and then you became more interested in the... Uh, so you got your degree in Harvard in CS, correct? So yes, I started majoring in, um, in physics, and then I uh, was became interested enough in computer science, um, thanks to... Th th this was probably driven most by um, my sophomore data structures uh, instructor, Umesh Bazarani. Um, he got me really interested in uh, algorithms and data structures, um, and that really set my path. And so I think sometime that year, I switched to a double major in physics and computer science. Um, and then by senior year, I mean, I, I struggled my way through to finish the physics major, but I actually switched the major to computer science and physics because um, I was really thinking much more about computer science than about physics uh, at that time. I had a... Uh, a roommate my, my junior year who was also majoring in physics. And that's when it became really clear to me that I did not have what it took to, uh, to do physics because we took many of the same classes and we worked on problems together sometimes. And um, my way of tackling physics problems was kind of like a mathematician. I would see the, uh, the initial definition of the problem as a sort of set of axioms to begin with. And I would try to uh, work forward from the, the problem statement in order to arrive at uh, a correct answer. And my, my roommate uh, would look at the question and would immediately know what the answer should be. 
and would then work backwards from the answer uh, to get to the initial conditions of the question. And so he was much better at understanding, you know, which which things were negligible and should be ignored, uh, and 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 such. And these were things that never came naturally to me. Um, thinking about computer science was much more natural, um, and so that that's where I headed. I also, I, I the way I accomplished both majors really was by taking a lot of mathematics classes, which qualified for both of the majors. Uh, I so I had relatively limited amount of physics, relatively limited amount of computer science, and, and quite a bit of math uh, as a way to fulfill all of the requirements. Mm. But by the time I graduated, I was very clear that, that I found computer science extremely exciting, and that's what I wanted to continue in. Uh, great. And I think you applied after that. So you got into Stanford. And did you get into MIT as well? <laughs> or so that I was year? actually rejected from MIT computer science. Uh, I was I was accepted in uh, mathematics yeah. uh, in, 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 the, in the math department. Um, yes, I, I still remember my senior year. I, I got home and I found an answering an ans a message on the answering machine from Donald Knuth. Yeah. Saying, <laughs> Congratulations, you've been admitted to Stanford. And uh, I, I did know who Donald Knuth was, and so that was that was extremely exciting. Um, there, there, there was also, I think, a message from Tom Layton saying that I did math. Uh, at the time, I did not know who Tom was. Um, and so that was not quite as, uh, quite as impactful. Yeah. But I think later you became more uh, familiar with him at Akamai and of course. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah uh, great actually to co-advise by uh, like uh, Tom Layton and Eric Demain. And both actually are great people. So uh, good. And, uh, so then you decided to go to Stanford. So how did yeah. you start essentially working with Rajiv? Actually, I was like, checking. You were among the his first students, a set of That's first right. students. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think Stephen Phillips may have been his first student, and I think he was a year or maybe two ahead of me. And um, somebody named Eric Torm. Um, uh, may have, I, I don't remember exactly the order, but uh, yeah, then I, I think I may have been the third uh, or so of his, uh, of his students. How did I start working with him? Um, so I met him when I was visiting Stanford. Um, I think actually at the time he was a postdoc um, at Stanford. I see. Um, but uh, he, he already at that time seemed like a plausible person for me to work with. I mean, again, I, I came into graduate school, you know, it, in those days uh, to do algorithms in graduate school, you did not need uh, a tremendous amount of background or preparation and you certainly did not need publications, right? I, I had no publication coming to graduate school. Um, the, the entirety of my <laughs> algorithms experience, I think, was um, Umesh's uh, undergraduate algorithms class um, and um, Michael Rabin's advanced algorithms class uh, at Harvard. I think those may have been all of the algorithms that I knew uh, at the time. And so I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I thought it was, a, it was an area I, I knew that I liked the mathematical side of computer science. Um, and um, uh, that was kind of it. So I was looking at theoretical computer science. Um, we looked at Berkeley and Stanford. My daughter, my, my uh, wife was looking at graduate school at exactly the same time. So we had a two body problem uh, to resolve. Um, I see. And Stanford, Stanford was the resolution for that two body problem. Um, and uh, because it looked like it was a place that had good, good departments, good teachers for both of us. Um, and then I went away to uh, study at Cambridge for a year on one of these after college fellowships. And then by the time I got back, Rajiv was a professor in um, the computer science department. Um, and the, the other faculty at that time were Serge Plotkin and um, Andrew Goldberg and uh, Don Knuth, of course, although I think Don was already kind of uh, emeritus and not really uh, taking students. Um, and so I think what drew me to, to Rajiv was his randomized algorithms class. Um, I see. It was one of the first classes that I took at uh, Stanford, either in my first or my second year. 
Um, and I just found it absolutely fascinating. Um, and it, it's kind of like you said, what, what really drew me was the amazing simplicity of the algorithms um, compared to like, you know, I was also taking, uh, you know, optimization algorithms and, and such. And it just, there was something so beautiful about the randomized algorithms that, that Rajiv taught. Um, and it, that, that, that really drew me in. Um, and I started thinking about research questions uh, that were sort of coming out of his uh, class. And as I started making progress on them, it just was really natural to connect with him as my advisor. Uh, uh, great. Yeah, I think you mentioned a few set of, I mean, great computer scientists. Hopefully, I maybe mean, we'll talk with them as well. I think Umesh Vazirani, I think at that time was Harvard, but then moved to uh, Berkeley. Well, actually, point. I think was, was already at Berkeley, but was visiting Harvard for a year. I see, I see. And I just got lucky that, that, I, that, that he was the teacher um, and was, was a very inspiring one. Uh, yeah, that's actually important. And I think you mentioned two common stories. I think I heard from others that like they didn't get for their PhD, they didn't get admission from MIT, later became professor there. So that's actually interesting. And another thing that, I mean, I think that happens also a lot that several people, I mean, uh, like they became like, first they were post like a place and then they became faculty. I think maybe less common nowadays, but uh, maybe more common, I think at that time, because Avrim Blum, for example, he mentioned the same story for um, CMU um, that he was a postdoc, Avrim Blum. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, in modern times, it seems like people take a postdoc after they have a faculty offer, right? Yeah. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to take a postdoc where you're going to be a faculty member. Exactly. So I think, I, then, <laughs> um, back, back in those days, I mean, I don't know, I, I suspect that Rajiv took his postdoc before applying for faculty positions. And I see, I see. then, you know, he applied. And I, I think if you, if you are a postdoc at an institution when you apply, I think it can give you a bit of an edge because you're very well known or you can make yourself well known. I that. mean, it can go both ways essentially, I think nowadays, because if the people say, oh, we know he maybe we want the new people, or this is like some kind of, well, I mean, yeah. I think I, I, so I think that there's definitely a phenomenon with graduate students applying to their own university um, where universities really try to stay away from that. Uh, the, the, the universities, many universities make a policy of not hiring their own graduate students because they feel like the relationship is too close and the advisor is too much, uh, has, has too much of a conflict of interest trying to get their own student hired and so forth. But I suspect with postdocs, they're, they're seen as more independent, and I think it's reasonable for them to make a, a mark um, as a postdoc and then get hired. But, but as I said, I think what works against that is that nowadays, most people seem to take postdocs after they have faculty offers. And so the, the opportunity doesn't really arise to, um, uh, to be a postdoc and apply where you're postdoc in. Mm, great. So, uh, mm, good. So I think uh, that's uh, about, I mean, we talk about uh, Rajiv. So how about working with uh, Rajiv? I mean, do you have any memory? I think, uh, like, uh, I think uh, that's the uh, one. He had a tragic life. Unfortunately, I think uh, I heard, I mean, I think, do you know the exact story? You can mention it or I can. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it a tragic life because I think his life was actually very good. He, he yeah, tragic a, death, I would say maybe. <laughs> death, uh, which was an accident. Um, he 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 sleepwalk. He was sleepwalking and and, and drowned in a pool, um, and um, that was a real tragedy because I mean he he was brilliant and I mean as you mentioned I think he was. I mean, besides all of his important contributions in theoretical computer science, he really was a mentor for many of the very important startup companies. And I think that he would have continued to have tremendous impact for decades um, if, if his life hadn't been cut short so early. Um, so, so it was a real loss. Um, yeah, and I think he had also great, I mean, lots of great uh, com like a computer scientists at the PhD students, I mean, now they are professors all over the place. I think you is just one yeah. of them. And like, I think I can name a, quite a few, I think, uh, uh, like Piotr Indyk, I think Moses Charikar, and 
lots yep. of Anjiv Khanna. Yeah, and lots of other Ashish, <laughs> great. Ashish Goel. Um, yeah. yeah, many, many uh, really successful, uh, re really successful students um, who, who did wonderful work. Uh, great. So, and, uh, any like uh, I mean, a nice story about him, or like the way that we can I mean just have some memory of him. Yeah, I mean, so Rajiv was a to, in my perception at least, Rajiv was a very quiet, I would say, introverted person, um, and I think w w we had a very a very positive, uh, successful advising relationship. Um, not one that I would describe as very personal though. Um, you know, I did a lot of research and I would meet with him often and talk to him about what I was doing and, and, and so forth. Um, it really did tend to focus on the, the research. There wasn't a lot of conversations about life or, uh, sort of, you know, we, we didn't, I, I know in some research groups, you know, there, there's a, a social aspect to it, you know, people will go to, you know, the, the group will go to movies together or go to parties together or, you know, very, you know, do events together. There wasn't so much, there, there wasn't really much of that. Um, you know, I, my, my experiences of Rajiv were in, in classes and in, um, uh, in, and in our research meetings. And um, that, that was kind of it. And I was very happy. I mean, I wasn't looking for more. Um, I mean, as a graduate student, you know, as a as a faculty member, I've had many years to think more about, you know, what's important for what, what do graduate students need, and you know, some graduate students need a lot more support. They do need a lot more of the sort of social uh, connection as well. Um, it, it wasn't something that I was really looking for, I think, and and and. So, I mean, I, I can't, I don't know how he treated his other graduate students, but, but for us, it was this sort of nice, uh, happy, professional uh, relationship. Um, he was, I, I really liked his lecturing. Um, I would characterize it as dry, uh, but not dull. Like he, it, it was dry, it was clear, it was precise. He always sort of said exactly what, what needed to be said um, and conveyed the information very clearly. But he wasn't an entertainer the way that some uh, instructors are. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, was not, there were no tricks with liquid nitrogen or ball bearings or anything like that. Yeah. Um, no props. Um, I guess the, if I'm gonna tell stories that this is a, sort of a story about both of us. Um, we, we had only a couple of papers that we did together. Um, and one of them was about a, um, a, a de-randomization. Um, you, you, you mentioned this you know, minimum cut algorithm. That was a randomized algorithm. And um, one of the questions that I was thinking about was whether it was possible to de-randomize uh, that algorithm. Um, the, the, main, the main purpose being to show that you could solve minimum cut deterministically in parallel. So we already had deterministic algorithms from, for minimum cut, sequential deterministic algorithms. Um, the, the contraction algorithm was the first parallel algorithm for minimum cuts, but was randomized. And so there was a natural question of whether it could be de-randomized to get a deterministic algorithm. Um, actually, believe it or not, this was a problem that actually two, three days ago, we were talking with uh, uh, actually a few of my students. <laughs> exactly oh, this problem. Fun. Because especially nowadays with the, like the map reduce word and like, you know, all this spark, etc. How can we do it actually efficiently there? <laughs> that was exactly yes. the problem. That I mentioned yes. that we are, I mean, actually calling uh, your name and your algorithms a lot in your research. And I believe lots of others because it's a, like a simple thing. I think that's the thing that generally remains. Yeah, I mean, parallel is when, when I was in, when I was in graduate school, it was kind of a, a decline in parallel algorithms. There had been a lot yeah. of interest there, there had been this burst of work on parallel architectures, parallel machines, um, and that led to an interest in parallel algorithms, the PRAM model and so forth. Um, but at that time, it really seemed like whenever somebody did a whole bunch of work to build a new kind of parallel machine, by the time they were done, the sequential machines had gotten faster than the parallel machines. Exactly. Were. And so 
but so, so we continue to we continue to be sort of interested in it as a theoretical domain, um, but it wasn't clear that it was having practical impact. Nowadays, I think parallelism is is here, right? And like it's it's everywhere. It's Thank not you. the Panama model, but it's very powerful and very important. So it's kind of nice to see that renaissance of parallelism. But anyway, yeah, uh, but yeah go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I think finish with <laughs> Rajiv. We will go there. Yeah. Yeah, just r running back to my story. So we were working on the theory of randomization. It was a purely a theoretical problem. I mean, the, the solution we came up with was really wacky. It basically, uh, you know, m many uh, many derandomization techniques involve a pseudo random generator where you, um, you you take a small seed and you use it to generate a large number of pseudo random bits. Um, to, to, that, that you use to fool your algorithm into thinking that it's running off of a random number generator. Um, and at the time, de-randomization was a very young field. Um, there were not that many ways to de-randomize. Um, there was one technique based on linear congruential generators and uh, one technique based on random walks on expanders. And we had this sort of wacky, uh, and, and so, we, we were working on trying to figure out how to make these things work. And um, I just, one, one uh, day I sort of had this inspiration that we could put them together. We could use the output of the uh, expander walk as an input to a linear congruential generator, uh, which would then provide the right kind of behavior for, um, uh, and, and I mean, we've been thinking about it for a long time, but there was this sort of one final insight that I had. And this is where the story happens, is that this insight happened on a Saturday. And for me, Saturday is a Sabbath. And I don't use electricity. I don't use communication tools. I had no way of getting in touch with Rajiv to let him know about this idea that, that I had. Yeah. Um, and so I was so excited about it that um, a, a few months before, uh, he'd had us to his house, like his graduate student to his house for a, a dinner party, um, as advisors should every once in a while. Um, and I really didn't remember exactly where, but I had a rough idea. And so basically, I took a long walk. Uh, we also don't drive. I took a long walk to the neighborhood and kind of wandered around looking for his house um, until I found it. And then I knocked on his door in order to just tell him, Rajiv, I figured out the, the final step of our, of our problem. And, you know, this is probably unexpected to have a random graduate student knocking on your door on a Saturday afternoon, but um, he was very gracious about it. We had a nice talk and that's sort of where we, you know, got to the, got to the solution. Of the problem. So, uh, yeah, surprising Rajiv, I think on Saturday. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so, and, uh, uh, great. I think you had also great uh, students. Uh, I mean, some, some of them, I think, uh, Deb Malia or others like Nicola, I was talking, I mean, I had papers actually with them. So uh, how do you think, I mean, that are actually good things about advising? So do you think that, I mean, like, what should be the relation, the optimal relation, or what you apply essentially when with your own students, like in terms of like social versus just separate things like the research from the social life or together? What, uh, what would be the optimum or what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, that, that's actually evolved a lot as I have moved from theoretical computer science into human computer interaction, which is the, the research that I do now. Um, my research group is much larger and much more social than it used to be. I think um, in, in my theory days, um, I think I took a much, I, I think I took a much more Rajiv-like uh, yeah, approach. That I can't tell actually. <laughs> Um, you know, we, we had, we had our research and we would get together and we, I mean, I met with each of, every one of my graduate students, I, I always meet with them every week, um, to, to sort of discuss what they're doing. And I also tend to have, tend to have an open door and, you know, they'll drop in when there are things that they want to talk about. Um, but it was very kind of research focused and, um, you know, we would, we would talk about the research and, um, you know, I mean, I also tried to give advice about, you know, career and, you know, how do you make sure that your work is known and, and, and things like that. But it was it was very uh, sort of work focused. Um, oh, proficient, yeah. And, and now now my group is much more sociable, much more collaborative. We, we talk about all sorts of things. We talk about the world. Um, we, we get together for, for parties every once in a while. Um, and I think 
I, I, I like this better. I, 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 I like the, the, the stronger social ties. Um, I feel like uh, the, the students I graduate now, I stay, I stay in touch with them better. They feel more like uh, friends um, and, and um, to longer, deeper connections than I had with uh, some, of my, some of my early graduate students who, you know, we, we worked great together, but sort of when they graduated, we kind of lost touch because we, we weren't working together anymore. And that was sort of the focus of our, of our work. Um, and I think, I think both of them work fine, right? I mean, you, you can be that sort of very professional advisor and just, you know, focus on the work. And, you know, once you graduate, that, that relationship is done and, um, you know, that, 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 that's over. Or you can, you, you can look at it more as your, your social environment and people who, who become your friends over time. Yeah, actually, I mean, <laughs> I think uh, I think both of them, uh, for different people, it may work at uh, like a different approach. But I think for me, actually, the second one works quite well. Like, uh, I think I have this thing. I don't call a student after 9 p.m. They, uh, I mean, they call me sometime. I mean, even <laughs> I will say, send them a message that if you are awake, call me. But I think we are talking all, I mean, over the, they essentially, or weekends, et cetera, they text me and they all have my phone number. They call me. I think I like it actually quite well. Like, as you mentioned, I should become more friendly. And mm -hmm. I think it has the, like, maybe long-term uh, also effect yeah, that you can be like a friend with them and work more with them. I, I think I think these are two not identical uh, issues. The, the question of access, like how easy it is for your students to reach you and when they can reach you and so on. I think I've always been a very accessible advisor. Like my, my students can contact me anytime. I, I think what's changed has been more about what we talk about, right? Like, like, what, like my, in, in the early days, my students could contact me anytime, but generally what we were talking about was the research, what was the work. Um, and, and that was brought. Yeah, I think <laughs> so if somebody calls you at nine after 9 p.m., I think it cannot be just completely <laughs> like about the uh, research because I think sometimes, I mean, for me, I just, we need to say, oh, you didn't sleep at least. <laughs> that, <laughs> so this type of thing that is the start of that. And, you know, when it starts, it may go some other places as well. That's like the mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, but I think I agree. I mean, that is not completely the same. But I think, you know, Again, just the fact that you both didn't sleep, for example, I don't know, at midnight, that I think <laughs> says something about your life as well. It's not just about the... That's right. Uh, yeah. Uh, great. Yeah, I think that we were talking about advising stuff uh, as well. So uh, I think, uh, let me see whether uh, there is uh, anything else uh, here. Yeah, so I think uh, I want to go also a little bit more slowly. I mean, because this is a general audience, we will put it on the podcast. So uh, let me talk a little bit about a randomized algorithm and your essentially the one that... Uh, so the first thing, uh, what was there uh, like, or were there too many randomized algorithms before I mean, your time? I think maybe we want to talk a little about randomized algorithms and the cut problems. I mean, sure. again, without any slides such that the people know about that, I think that would yeah. be useful for the general audience because these are very sure. important problems. Yeah. Sure. So yes. Um, so I I was very <laughs> I picked a very good time to be born. Um, and and that sort of, I, I got into graduate school at the right time yeah. for this for this domain. Um, you know, when when I started uh, graduate school in 1990, um, randomized algorithms was definitely a thing, but it was still a very much a new thing. So we had enough randomized algorithms to teach a course. I mean, uh, as I said, I took Rajiv Madwani's course. Um, and that course uh, is essentially what you can find in the randomized algorithms textbook, which was published around 1995 or 1996. So he hadn't written the book yet, but that was material. And a lot of that material predates uh, or, or is around 1990. So, um, you know, we, we, we had, you know, we had hashing, we had randomized primality testing, um, and, and, and so there was plenty to talk about, but there were very basic things like minimum cut, which nobody had thought about yet. And so 
you didn't have to have, you, you, there wasn't a lot that you had to learn. Like if, if you took one course on randomized algorithms, you basically knew the field and you were at the cutting edge and you were prepared to, to do research in, in, in new problems. And there were plenty of very easy to see problems where people had not yet thought about how to use randomization to solve them. So it was a great time to be working in randomized and so, I mean, like in general, I think just we define the randomized algorithm. So there is the regular algorithm plus some random bits that we are doing it. I think nowadays probably, I mean, of course, I mean, there are both uh, like uh, some of the basic algorithms which are not uh, randomized. Uh, like, uh, like, let me ask you this question. So if you want to design algorithm, so nowadays, are you thinking more about just the random, like randomization is always part of the, things or I mean sometime also you will think more about just deterministic. Yeah, so I certainly I I my teaching still consists of two separate courses, advanced algorithms and randomized algorithms. Um, and advanced algorithms has almost no randomization in it. I, I teach hashing um, and, and a couple of other a couple of other randomization techniques. Um, but then randomized algorithms, the entire semester devoted to, to that topic, which again is similar to Rajiv's book, um, although I've added, I've added material that has arisen since. And this really does not make sense as a modern division of algorithms. I mean, at, at this point, randomization is one of many fundamental techniques in algorithms. And if you're going to learn algorithms, you have to learn randomization. It's definitely not the answer to every problem. There are all sorts of problems where it doesn't, it, where there's no particular use for randomization. Um, but there are so many places where it's useful, you definitely want to be thinking about it from the beginning. And so if I were designing my courses now, um, I would probably structure them differently as sort of a first semester of algorithms, including randomization, and a second semester of algorithms, including randomization. Um, also, I mean, when I, when I created these courses in the mid 90s, they were the cutting edge courses. But at this point, algorithms has moved much further. And these, these are just, you know, the, the first graduate classes that you take in these topics. And there are many more semesters of material to learn if you really want to be on the cutting edge of uh, algorithm design. Yeah, so I think now it is much more deeper, essentially, if you want to yes. go there, as you mentioned. And it's much yes. maybe harder, it's more, I mean, become like more math that like, if you want to do algebraic geometry in math, you need to actually, for two, three years, maybe three, four years, exactly. you need to just read the materials before you can do things. That's, that, that, that's, yeah. that's absolutely right. And, and again, that's why I said I was very fortunate in my choice of when I went to graduate school, because I don't think that I am particularly well, well suited to doing the kind of algorithms that is done nowadays. I think, yeah. it, I think it takes a lot more depth than I have. Uh, but actually I can add, I mean, some of this, I think uh, like nowadays I'm talking with the students, um, is this uh, MPCS stuff or like a parallel algorithm? I mean, there are some lots of intersection with the PIRAM models. Mm -hmm. uh, the PIRAM was the oldest style like uh, parallel algorithms, like a Spark or MapReduce yes. and others are just the yes. general MapReduce. Uh, and the interesting thing is that there are some of these algorithms that I will tell them actually, that's the time that you can design the algorithm. We have like, for example, one plus epsilon approximation for uh, edit distance in the yes. uh, MapReduce uh, in mm -hmm. constant, uh, I think in only, uh, I think two rounds or something like this. And mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting because I think probably this will not happen again, as you mentioned. <laughs> is it the right time to consider this one? Yes. And these are some of the things that Piram, I mean, the older style didn't um, touch them that much because generally, even if you want to a simple thing like X or of some numbers, you need log N times. Or their one, uh, like a number of rounds is something that has not been considered that much essentially right. in the PIRAM right. model. So that's a good time actually to design this simple algorithm yes. that yes. As, everybody as, can use it. As you said, this is the natural progression in any field, right? Is that you have this, this early time when the field is being defined. Um, and that happened before I started graduate school, right? The randomized algorithms was an understood domain when I started but it had not yet really been worked at very much. And so 
there was a lot of low hanging fruit. A lot of uh, a lot of progress that you could make, I think, with relatively simple ideas. Once we mined that out, you needed more and more sophistication, more and more uh, depth, in order to be able to make further progress. Um, and I think that, that's where we are now. Yeah, and I mean, the finding a nice problems essentially it would be not that uh, like a clean problem. I will say with the clean solution it must become harder and harder. It's still possible, yes. but I think less likely because yes. people have also considered those type of uh, things. Yeah, so I think and now uh, let's talk about essentially the cut problem. I want to actually mention the algorithm. It's a very nice algorithm. I think you can mention it or I can mention it that, I, but then at least I'm defining the problem. Generally, I mean, you have a graph and network, a set of edges. Uh, this is for general audience. And the one important thing is that you have this graph, you want to solve the problem. It's complicated. You can consider a social network or anything. And you want to solve some problem on this one. I don't know. Find the, like, uh, uh, <laughs> like you want to find the minimum number of people that you can influence lots, the, a good part of this network, for example. Or uh, like with the given budget, you want to give advertise for them or something like this. And the question is that, I mean, always this kind of divide and conquer plays a very important role because you want to consider the whole graph, you want to somehow divide it. What's the division? Essentially cut a problem that you want to cut it at some place such that you can solve in this part, in this part, and then paste them together. And that's the thing that essentially cut problems becomes hugely important. And again, like in some sense, even if you consider the new world, like the MPC world or like this Spark others, it is the case that different parts of the graph will be essentially kept at different computers and the edges in between, they form the cut. And these are some of the things that you need to handle. But I think uh, the great uh, algorithm, so one of the most basic one is that you are given a graph, you want to cut it into half, I mean, not half, you want to just cut it into two parts. What should be the way? Of course, one way is to consider any vertex and cut all the edges that are attached to it. That's one way, but that might be not the optimum things because you can consider two complete graphs that only have one edge in between and you can cut that. So the mean cut becomes a non-trivial problem. And I think you want to say the nice algorithm that actually you had it for that. And I think that's a great algorithm. <laughs> Whenever I think about it, it's like a very nice one. Yeah. Sure, sure. So actually, I mean, the, the, the kinds of divide and conquer problems that you describe, um, they, they, they push you, as you know, towards uh, other variant, other variations of where the balance is important. But actually the, the, the oldest application of MinCut that I'm familiar with actually happened um, in World War II, I think, um, where they were looking at rail networks, railway networks. Yes. And the goal was to, uh, it was called the network inhibition problem. They, they wanted to know if you were going to try and prevent the rail from working, right? If you, in order to do that, you would want to bomb some of the tracks yeah. in order to prevent <laughs> people from getting from point no A to point B, right? And so if you think about it, if you want to prevent people from getting from point A to point B in the railway network, you have to make sure that there is no way to reach point A, from point A to point B by rail. Um, and what that means is you have to break the railway network into two pieces. There has to be a piece that can be reached from A and a piece that can be reached from B, and there has to be no connection between those two pieces. So you're trying to figure out how to, how to bomb the network so that you break the railway network into two disconnected pieces. And of course, it's a natural uh, objective to try to minimize the number of uh, bombing runs that you have to use. How many different times do you have to actually go and how many different parts of that railway network do you actually need to go and bomb? So that's the earliest example of this problem that I can. That I, can. I just want to add, unfortunately, I mean, we may think about this was from the, I mean, the World War II, but I think unfortunately, currently the same thing uh, similar thing may happen in uh, Ukraine, actually. Oh, <laughs> the no. same thing that they are trying to cut the things. That, yeah. It is a very natural problem for, you know, an army to be thinking about. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's unfortunate that we have armies, right? That, that yeah. is, uh, you know, <laughs> more, worse than that, we have wars now, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Now, just another interesting side note is that 
I th what I what I understand, I, I don't know if I can find the reference quickly, but at the same time as one group was trying to figure out how to do this, um, another group was trying to figure trying to solve the problem of how do you maximize the amount of material that you can transport from point A to point B in the network. And as we know from the famous work of Ford and Fulkerson, these two questions are very intimately related by what's called the Max Flow and Cut Theorem. So you had the two sides of the army solving this, solving a problem in a duel, which I think. Uh, is, is, is interesting. Anyway, so you asked me to talk about the algorithm. So yes, so the question is, you have this network and you wanna remove the smallest possible number of edges so that you disconnect that network into more than one piece, okay? And this, this is known as the minimum cut, right? If you consider any partition of the network into two pieces, um, there, there are certain edges that cross between the two pieces. And that, that set of the number of those edges is called the value of that cut. So if your plan is to break the network into two pieces, you want to find the two pieces with the fewest edges crossing between them. And that's called the minimum cut of that network. Um, and so how do you hunt for that minimum cut? Well, the, the idea of the contraction algorithm is that um, if you're looking for the minimum cut, the cut with the fewest possible edges, well, then most of the edges in the graph probably aren't edges that are crossing the minimum cut. And so um, if you randomly pick an edge, uh, then you might hope that you, are re that you have good luck and don't pick an edge that crosses the minimum cut. And if you know that your edge does not cross the minimum cut, well, this edge is connecting two different vertices of the graph. And if the edge does not cross the minimum cut, it must be that both of those vertices are on the same side of the minimum cut. And once you know that those two vertices are on the same side of the minimum cut, you can merge those two vertices. You can, you can combine them into one vertex, or you can imagine just drawing a big circle around them. And all of the edges that come into to either of those vertices, you, you bring those edges together uh, into the new vertex that you create. And so this, reduces the number of vertices in the graph by one. It replaces two vertices with one vertex. So you have a smaller graph. And once you have a smaller graph, you can imagine applying the same procedure again. Pick a random edge and hope that it is not at the minimum cut. And if you keep doing this over and over again, and you're, if you're lucky every single time, you will keep on merging vertices that are on the same side, but you'll never merge two vertices that are on opposite sides because that would happen when you pick an edge that does cross the cut. And so if you keep on merging the vertices that are on the same side and never merge vertices that are on the opposite sides, then eventually you're going to end up with one vertex that represents the merger of everything on one side and another vertex that represents the merger of everything on the other side. And all of the edges that remain will connect those two vertices. And those remaining edges will be the edges that cross the cut. And so that will, that will find the minimum cut for you. But once you have two vertices, there's only one cut. You have to separate those two vertices. And if you were lucky all the way along, that cut will be the minimum cut. Uh, I think now, the proof that you have is that this luckiness actually happens uh, quite often. At like yes, the... exactly. So the, 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 the contribution or, or the, the, the analytic work is to, is to actually analyze how likely are you to be lucky, exactly. right? And that, that, that took a little bit of work, but really not very much. It's a, it's a one page proof um, to, to show that you, that you are lucky enough. One thing that's a little bit weird about this algorithm is that most randomized algorithms have a pretty good chance of succeeding. This algorithm actually has a pretty small chance of succeeding, but it is, uh, as we say in the, in the community, is, it is one over a polynomial which means that if you just repeat the algorithm a polynomial number of times, that will increase your chance of succeeding uh, to, to a reasonable value so that you can count on getting the right answer. Essentially, you will boost it and you will take the minimum over all iterations. Exactly, you'll, you'll repeat the algorithm many, many times. And thanks to the repetition, it increases your odds of success. And so at least one of these times, you will find the minimum cut. And, and yes, so since the minimum cut is the smallest cut, if you just take the smallest value you ever see, that's likely to be the minimum cut. Uh, great. Yeah, I think that's actually very similar to the one that you described, I think, almost 21 years ago when I took the course with you. Yes, <laughs> well, yes. I it's, it's a very simple algorithm with a very simple 
simple story, so I haven't really changed the description. <laughs> Yeah, and the same, and I think the audience, they can notice. I mean, that's a very simple algorithm. You will just, the whole the network, you will consider one edge. You will, we call it contraction, essentially, and just repeat such that there are two vertices, that's a cut. But of course, the analysis actually is cute. Lots of these uh, randomized algorithms. And I think one other thing that I learned from the <laughs> class is that, like, if you go, uh, if you go the correct way, the algorithm, this proof is simple. If you go the wrong way, it can be very messy, actually, randomized mm -hmm. algorithm. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, the whole idea is that when you want to analyze a randomized algorithm, what would be not the messy way, <laughs> like the clean way such that you can analyze this? Because lots of dependencies and others that happen. Well, you know, that, that's the thing. I, I actually, I, I arrived, this is not the first analysis that I have uh, for this algorithm. Um, I, and actually, the, the, the way that I came up with this algorithm is actually a pretty funny story um, on its own um, that not many yeah, people mentioned briefly, yeah. <laughs> so um, I actually was not working on the minimum cut problem. Um, what happened was that I was taking Rajiv's class, and he was introducing all of these techniques, and I decided that I wanted to uh, try to develop a randomized algorithm for something. Um, and the problem I decided to work on was minimum spanning tree. Yeah. Um, because I had been uh, in, a, in, a, in a separate class, uh, somebody had taught me about Fibonacci heaps and how they could be used to do a faster minimum spanning tree algorithm. But there was this open question about how fast can you solve minimum spanning tree? Um, and I decided I wanted to do a randomized algorithm for minimum spanning tree. And that's where I started working. Um, and again, all I had were the techniques from Rajiv's class. One of Rajiv's, one of the techniques we were learning about was random sampling. So, so the question I asked was, if you have a graph and you choose a half of the edges at random, um, how good of a minimum spanning tree do you get in that sample uh, compared to the, the actual minimum spanning tree of the entire network? Um, and, I decided that that problem was challenging. And so when you have a challenging problem, you try to find simpler versions of it. So I said, okay, one of the things that's making challenging is the, the costs on the edges. So let's not think about costs. Let, let's just ask if I choose a bunch of edges at random from the graph, um, what is the probability that the graph is connected? That, that, the, that the edges that I choose give me a connected graph, okay? and um, this is also, this, this is equivalently asking, if I choose these edges at random, what is the probability that there is a cut of the graph where I don't choose any edges? And so I was asking this question because I wanted to solve minimum spanning tree, okay? But once I asked it um, and, and thought about it, it was clear that, well, which cut is the least likely to have any edges chosen? Well, it's the minimum cut. And so that kind of led me eventually to be thinking about, well, is this a, maybe this is a way of finding minimum cuts, right? Because the minimum cut is distinctive that it is usually not, it is that the least likely to have edges chosen. So I was asking questions like, if you choose every edge with probability P, well, the, there's a certain probability that you don't choose an edge from the minimum cut, but then, then I started thinking about what does it do to the rest of the graph? Well, every vertex has a, a large degree, so probably many of the vertices will have edges chosen. So probably if you contract all of those edges, you will make the graph much smaller. And so I was looking uh, not at picking one edge at a time, but picking many edges at a time and what happens. But what I discovered was this weird thing that as I made the edge choice probability smaller and smaller, the analysis got tighter and got the, the result got better and better in terms of the runtime of this procedure. And again, one night when I was, I mean, I, I used to just go out at night and wander around the, the uh, Escondido village where the graduate students housing is. I would just wander around thinking about these problems. And one night I figured out that, well, the smallest P would be one where you just pick one edge at a time. And once I thought about it in terms of picking one edge at a time, then it became clear how to do this very simple analysis. But I, I only got there from thinking about an entirely different problem. 
You yeah, just went sorry. mute. Yeah, you think mute. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and I think uh, here, like this is sometimes like from different problem, but I mean, of course, I think the algorithm also probably was a bit more complicated at the beginning as well. Also, it's, yes, I mean, because it was that happened a lot. The original algorithm is pick every edge of probability p and contract all of them at once. And now the analysis actually was was relatively complicated. Yeah, and I think this is I think a, a, a takeaway that if you do the randomized algorithm, you really need to find the correct way to doing that. Otherwise, it would be a mess, and you don't uh, uh, actually <laughs> get the results. Uh, great. So I think, uh, by the way, in the talk actually we go sometimes technical. We talk about social things, so essentially combination. This way that David mentioned about advising a PhD student. So such that I mean there are essentially uh, like material for everyone if you want. If you are more in depth, you can get some of this. If not, I think you can get some ideas. And I think one interesting problem about we talk about the cut. I think David mentioned about the minimum spanning tree. That's essentially a, you want to find the minimum set of edges that you will form essentially a connected network in things. And that's actually quite interesting. That actually these problems, in some sense, they are dual of each other. You want to connect or cut in planar graphs. These are exactly the dual, but. Actually, in real world, also, I think I, now I can say after like lots of work that done in the field that generally I will say the cut problems, uh, like again, several algorithms that you may have it for connectivity it may work for cut, uh, but cut problems often become a bit more complicated than the connectivity problems. And that's uh, in the general sense of, I mean, the things that I have it anyhow, these are just some <laughs> general things. So, and if we talk about min cut, because I think that was, was it the main topic of your uh, thesis that also got the ACM thesis award? Yes, so, so my thesis was on randomized algorithms for graph optimization problems, and it included this minimum cut problem. Mm -hmm. And from that minimum cut problem, there followed a, a lot of work on maximum flows and other related network optimization problems. And also, um, eventually, I got back to the minimum spanning tree problem, and we did figure out, along with Philip Klein and, and Bob Tarjan, how to actually use randomization for minimum spanning tree. And so that was part of my thesis as well. And there was also, I, think, I can't remember if I did a little bit of graph coloring in the, in the thesis or not. Um, but uh, uh, but anyway, we had one question, actually. Somebody asked, so can you explain the, uh, the biomedical applications of randomized algorithm? I don't know. <laughs> this is like the, do uh -huh. you have any ideas that you may, something in top of your, yeah. So I have done relatively little um, in biology. Um, I do have one co-authored paper uh, with my brother-in-law, who is a professor of bioengineering, at MIT, um, where we use maximum flows uh, in order to solve a, 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 a genomic network uh, problem. But I will say that that was a deterministic algorithm. So, you know, I don't think, you know, it, it, I think that we have many different techniques, you know, divide and conquer, random sampling, uh, uh, hashing, uh, and, and some of these techniques are randomized and some of them are deterministic. And it's not like, you know, in this applied domain, only the randomized techniques work. And in this applied domain, only the, right? the, the whole idea of, of algorithms is that it's like a toolbox. You, you, you have a wrench and you have a hammer and you have a pliers. And for any given problem, what the algorithmist knows how to do is to reach into the toolbox and find the appropriate tool uh, for the particular problem that you're trying to solve. And half of the time that, that will be a randomized tool and half of the time it will be a deterministic tool. Yeah, I think that's a great point that you mentioned. I think here also we should say, I mean, like for example, there's the approximation algorithm. I remember actually like, a, like in 2000, there was a randomized algorithm course or approximation algorithm course. Uh, but actually nowadays, if you say, approximation and you don't talk about randomization, it's a bit odd because yeah, they are approximation inside, you may use randomization as well. So it's a combination. That's right. And I think uh, also this minimum cut problem that we cut or general cut problems are like, if you consider the protein network or something, they have lots of applications there. So in that sense, when you go there, there are some applications there as well. So these are like yes, really basic that's ones. That's yeah. And another really important one is that a lot of, a lot of, um, medicine, a lot of biomedical research 
makes very heavy use of hashing, right? I mean, you, you, you need exactly. these large hash databases of genomic sequences and such. Um, and hashing is fundamentally a randomization, a, 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 is an application of randomization ideas. Sometimes in practice, you don't randomize when you're hashing, but all of the insights about hashing come from thinking about it as a randomizing process. Uh, great. Actually, I think you mentioned the great thing that the next topic. So this is like the, we are talking about hashing and I think the distributed hashings. And uh, I think this is the, one of the work that you will see this is like back in, I think around 1998 or something like this. this I, I think this paper that you had it about the distributed uh, hashes and still it is the one that used like at Google or others that we are doing. That's like a very big things. Uh, I will say lots of this, I mean, like we have the YouTube, I can assure you that somewhere this kind of distributed hashes has been used, <laughs> like the fact that we are seeing that. And you want to maybe talk about, I mean, this, and I think this is the greatest startup that I, I think uh, you were also one of the pioneers that worked with Tom on uh, those, at least the, the paper was that, and I think you were involved as far as I remember with Akamai. This is like mm -hmm. a great company and it's doing, uh, so Akamai, I think for those people who, don't know. I think the CEO is Tom Layton. Was my uh, currently is, uh, Tom Layton, and uh, essentially it uh, caches everything that we will see. And that was maybe pre YouTube. That was very important because you don't want that. Like if everyone wants to go and see CNN, then the CNN website will crashes. The, that Akamai essentially replicates that content of CNN on lots of computers, and then it decides that whenever traffic comes, the traffic like a internet traffic comes to which uh, uh, essentially copy should send such that there is not much of the traffic. And this is like talking about hash table, like hashes and distributed hashes. I think you may want to talk a little bit about the story of that and how even Akamai has been started, which is now is a great company, it's a public company and yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, so this started um, just a couple of years after I started work at MIT. Um, and um, you know, I was still doing algorithms research then, but I was, I, I was very enthusiastic about algorithms and its potential to have real world impact, uh, d direct impact on practice. And I was very interested in finding research problems that were, that were practical, that were, that were applied research problems where algorithms might be able to have a meaningful impact. Uh, so could, could, we, could we find some practical problem, identify an algorithmic problem in it, um, solve that algorithmic problem, and then turn around and use what we had solved in order to make an impact in practice. And so back in 1997, or maybe even 1996, which was just the year after I started at MIT, um, Tom Layton and I were talking. Um, and actually, so... I, I know how this started, but I don't remember the, the individuals. So either, I, I think it was me, but it might have been Tom, um, had a conversation with Tim Berners-Lee. So Tim Berners-Lee was the person who created the World Wide Web. And, and he has a Turing um, Award as well, yeah. Yes, he's got a Turing Award, he's gotten everything. Um, I don't think he can get a Nobel Prize because we don't have one in computer science, but he's, he's won everything else. Um, and, um, uh, at the time, our, our lab director, th this was the very early days of the web, but our lab director knew that it was very important and he actually invited Tim Berners-Lee to set up the World Wide Web Consortium in our lab at MIT. So Tim Berners-Lee actually worked down the hall from us. Um, and so I, either I or Tom had a conversation with him where Tim Berners-Lee brought up this problem that people were running into on the web, uh, which was called at that point flash crowds. Um, so as you were saying, every once in a while, some web page would become incredibly popular and everybody on the internet would be trying to visit that web page at the same time. And that web page was stored on some poor web server. And basically that web server would receive thousands or even millions of requests all at once. And it just did not have the computational resources necessary to provide the requested page to everybody who wanted it. Um, and so almost everybody who asked for that page would have to sit there twiddling their thumbs for 10 minutes or 20 minutes or, or wait until tomorrow um, until they could actually see that web page. Um, and so 
he, Tim Berners-Lee wanted to solve that problem. And Tom Layton and I decided that it would be a fun problem to work on, to see if we could apply. I mean, it seemed like an algorithmic problem and we wanted to figure out if we could, uh, if we could maybe solve it. Um, the, the obvious technique to apply was something called caching, which is um, if, if you have something which is very popular, what you should do is make many copies of it and store those many copies of it in many different places. And now hopefully the many people who want that page will not all try and get it from the same place. Instead, they will visit all the different places where copies of that page are stored. And that means that only a few people will visit each location. And that way each of the locations will have the computational resources needed to serve that page. And everybody will be able to get that page quickly. So that was the goal, was to, make, was to figure out how to make copies of this page to many different caches all over the, the internet um, uh, so that everybody could get the page that they wanted quickly, okay? Um, so that was, that was the obvious part, but the unobvious part was, how are you going to decide where to put these copies of this page? And how are you going to direct people to get to the right places to, 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 how do you direct people to places that have the copies so that they can ask for those copies and get them, right? So, you know, even at that time, there were millions of websites. You're not gonna put a copy of the page on every website, right? It's only going to be in a relatively small number of places. So how are people gonna know where it is? Um, and one obvious answer would be that, well, you could ask the original host of the page, where are their copies of the page? And this is actually the way some early systems worked. The problem is that if the, craze, if the page is incredibly popular, then the host will just get too many requests to tell you where the page, right? For, forget about serving the page, just, just, telling, just redirecting people to the appropriate locations is too much work for a single web server and it wouldn't be able to provide the redirections. So what you really need is a way for the people who want the page to be able to figure out by themselves where are copies of that page, okay? Um, and there was already an answer to this in the algorithms toolbox called hashing, okay? So hashing is a very well-known technique uh, originated by people like Knuth in the 1960s for telling you if you have many different storage locations, where is a particular piece of information stored? Uh, you basically take the, some sort of uh, name or identifier for that information. You apply what's known as a hash function. And that hash function produces a value that is the, the identity of a particular storage location for the information. Okay. I don't know if you want me to say more about hashing, but um, so we knew about, so, so everybody knew about hashing and it seemed like an obvious way to solve this problem. Uh, the problem was, that when you use traditional hashing, you assume that the set of storage locations is fixed and permanent. There, there are 1,000 boxes and the items are spread around the 1,000 boxes. So for example, uh, if you have 1,000 boxes, one way to compute a hash function is, suppose you need to look up a zip code, right? Which has five digits. So there are, uh, there are 10,000 possible zip codes. Um, you want to look up, you, you want to store information about each zip code in one of these thousand boxes. Which zip codes go in which boxes? Well, a very easy solution is to simply remove the first digit of the zip code. Now you have four digits, sorry, remove the first two digits of the zip code. Now you have three digits, which represent a number between zero and 999. And so you can use that to represent which box the information about that zip code should be stored. So that works great if you know what your boxes are. The problem was that on the internet, the boxes are the web servers and they keep coming and going. Sometimes that web server is working, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's overloaded, sometimes it has spare capacity. Um, and so it, it's this weird hashing problem where not only are you being asked about, you know, who knows what web page, you also don't have an advanced knowledge of which websites might actually be available to serve that web page. And so this made it a weird hashing problem that had not previously been solved. And so we recruited a group of four students, uh, Matt Levine, Rina Panagrahi, 
uh, Danny Lewin and Eric Lehman uh, to sort of work on this problem. And we did, we sort of wrestled with how do we deal with the fact that buckets come and go? Um, and I still remember, I mean, we, we made slow progress on this problem. Um, I still remember the, a really important breakthrough happened when Denny Lewin and I were walking together to pick up our kids from daycare because they, they both went to the same uh, daycare location. Um, and we, we went together and we're talking about the problem. And Danny had this really important insight that basically cracked open the problem and allowed us to, to come up with a solution. And the solution we came up with was something called consistent hashing. Um, it is a different kind of hashing where you can insert and remove uh, items into buckets uh, of your hash table, but you can also insert and remove buckets. And this is what was weird about consistent hashing. And so if you think about it, when you remove a bucket, you have to move all of the items in the bucket to other locations. When you add a bucket, you probably wanna move items from the other locations into the bucket so that everything is kind of evenly spread out. Because remember, the idea here is that you don't want any one web server to work too hard. So you wanna spread the work among the, the many web servers. So consistent hashing is a technique for figuring out as buckets come and go, which items belong in which buckets, and uh, as buckets come and go, moving the items around between the buckets. Uh, and that's what, that, that we, we basically developed this new technique, this new data structure, this consistent hashing data structure. And we published a paper about that in stock in 1998, I think. Yeah. Um, but uh, it really did seem to be a solution to this flash count problem that Tim Berners-Lee was talking about. And, um, Danny Lewin was definitely the, uh, the, the instigator here. Danny Lewin said, okay, we've got this idea. We can make a company. We can actually solve this problem in practice. And um, Danny uh, had a tremendous amount of energy um, and was a great salesman and you know, brilliant. Um, and he kind of had so much enthusiasm. It kind of pulled me and Tom uh, into the into the company, um, Tom took some time off. I think to to be a co-founder of the company. Um, I stayed at MIT and was sort of a less. I, I had a lesser role. Uh, you know, I, I, I worked at the company. I did research, um, but they the two of them were definitely sort of the major. You know, they 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 made that company and carried it, and I kind of went along for the ride. Um, and it really worked. Like the, that, as, as you say, uh, this, this technique really did work. It really did allow us to create this company, Akamai, which um, took off very, very rapidly. Um, and I mean, uh, it, it's also used, I, I've heard it's also used in the Amazon's S3 storage system and in the, the Cassandra database. I think there, there are many applications of this consistent hashing idea. Um, the, the real sort of sign of its success was also a, a day of tragedy. It was, it was uh, September 11th, 1991, um, when the, the Twin Towers were, were uh, bombed by the, the airliners. Um, and this was a disaster of you know, national proportions. And everybody wanted to see the news websites to understand what was going on. And at that time, it was actually quite clear which of the news websites were using Akamai because those websites, you could actually get to the content and see what was the news. Whereas the news websites that were being hit, that, that were not caching, that were being hit by these flash crowds, they were, were swamped and, and could not serve the content. So if I remember correctly, CNN was, I think, one of our earliest customers. And CNN was serving content about September 11th through the Akamai network and was able to keep up with the traffic. And so it was really the success story of Akamai. And the tragic story was that Danny Lewin was on one of those airplanes that was uh, flown into the World Trade Center. And, and, and that's when he died. Uh, and so- Yeah, the very tragic story, yeah. The day, the, day, the day of tremendous success was like he didn't get to see it, um, and even worse, he was the he was a part of the tragic event that that demonstrated the success of that company. 
Uh, yeah, I think like a tragic actually event. I think this view that you mentioned, like I knew about the, the like like um, he had been killed in that uh, things, but I think this view I didn't have it actually. Very, uh, I mean, yeah, a tragic story. Uh, uh, great. Yeah, actually, uh, let me add also a little bit about it. So the impact of theory. I think uh, this is the one that I mean David talk about consistent hashing. This is like we are talking about 1996. I mean, they like maybe work for like one or two years. There was a stock paper, like a, one of the top theory conferences essentially published there. Interestingly, this uh, now it is a 2000, uh, uh, 20, uh, like 2022. And uh, I mean, I'm glad actually the past, I mean, few years, I took actually I mean, more like the system path. I think I will try to write some programs. I understand better the system. I think that's actually great for the theoretician to do that, uh, that's uh, uh, very important. And I think you will see that. And uh, interestingly, if you work, for example, with Kubernetes, or like, for example, a Google app engine, or this, all of them are using exactly this consistent hashing. That's the very important one. The whole Kubernetes is actually based on this fact that you want to distribute everything such that the load on one guy is actually not much. And yeah, you see that- really you know, Kubernetes was using it as well. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so that's uh, like one of the things that I mean, when you want to do it essentially, uh, all of like, for example, you can bring a Google App Engine, but actually that is based on some versions of Kubernetes. And all of them are based on these things. And this is like a great thing. Everything almost is Kubernetes nowadays. And you will see that, I don't know, 25, 26 years later, it's still the same thing that is working. And I think the difference probably is that at that time, there was one company like Akamai that could do that. Now, everyone can do that. You want to do that, you just bring this Kubernetes or use, for example, Google App Engine or similar things in AWS and others, and they will do the job for you. And this is, you need to do that. This is the must. If you don't do that, then, I mean, good luck. Then I think the number, that's exactly the idea that, for example, if the too many requests are coming to one instance, then create another instance, for example, on a different computer and route them and ask you how do you want to route even flexible routing or like continuation. These are actually very nice things that still these are the same set of things, even if you want to do it 25 years later. So these are the fundamentals of theory. I think that's the, that you yeah, know I, the theory, think... then you can get it much better about that. I think it's important to sort of see that, you know, the idea of consistent hashing is an algorithm, right? It's, it's a mathematical construct. Um, and uh, I think fortunately it can't be patented, right? You, you can't patent an algorithm, yes. right? Um, I mean, you can, and, I think, uh, yeah, but you can probably uh, force. No, no, no. <laughs> the, the important thing, so Akamai has a number of patents, uh, right? But, and, and these were important for the founding of the company, but these patents are on, a particular application of this algorithm to web caching, right? And um, that was very useful. That, that gave Akamai a, a very useful piece of intellectual property yes. that allowed that company to be very successful. Um, at the same time, the algorithm has many, right? This is true of most of the things in the algorithms toolbox. You can use the ideas over and over again. So. You know, the, the, this idea of consistent hashing has applications all over the place to, in peer-to-peer -peer systems and, as you said, in Kubernetes and, and distributed uh, databases and so forth. And it's great. That, that, again, I think this is the important thing that algorithmic research contributes to the world is these, these, uh, these tools in the toolbox that you can use over and over again. Yes, and that's, I mean, like, actually uh, great to have this uh, toolbox and they have uh, uh, lots of uh, applications there. So, uh, uh, so have you been involved in any other, like, uh, uh, companies or a startup after that? Uh, yes, I, I mean, I have, I mean, not, not a lot of them, uh, but, uh, and, and they've come more out of the, the human-computer interaction work that yeah, I, um, I think we can go talk the, about that later but uh, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we will talk about that part i think to just uh, uh, finish uh, this part also uh, one other things uh, that um yeah i think you want to talk about a uh, short as well i think you call it short correct Chord. Okay. a chord, chord. actually <laughs> that, like, yeah yeah so that's another i think big things that you have done it in the networking i think that's important and 
Like maybe just say the simplest stuff that people can understand it better. That would be the thing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Quark, Quark was actually a kind of a natural outgrowth of the consistent hashing work that that happened at Akamai. Um, it, it it happened because um, uh, Jan Stoika, um, who was a uh, graduate student at the time, or a postdoc or something, um, was, was spending time at MIT and. Uh, I mean, again, I have always had this real interest in working with practitioners and trying to identify algorithmic problems that emerge from what they want to do in practice and um, trying to figure out how algorithms can contribute back into practice. And so um, Jan Stoika was around and uh, three of my colleagues, Franz Kashuk, Robert Morris, and Hari Balakrishnan, and they were just starting to think about peer-to-peer -peer systems. And, this was this emerged. I think I think what kicked this off was Napster. Um, I don't know how many people in in this call are old enough to remember Napster, but this was the first kind of big file sharing, uh, distributed file sharing uh, service. You know, somebody had started up the service so that everybody who had music could share the music that they had on their computers with all of the other people in the world. Um, and all of the record companies hated this idea, but all of the all of us who listen to music love this idea that we would be able to- You can get it for free. Music. And then not just music, movies, I think. I think the Cody or others, there are always one version of that. If you search, you will find the current version of that. The first one was Napster. Back then, I don't think we had the bandwidth to share movies, right? This, this was earlier days of the internet. But just being able to share music was, was really an exciting idea. Um, and so Napster was this company that was, or this service that was up and running. Um, it, it didn't last. Eventually the music companies kind of sued it out of existence. Um, but it, it introduced this idea of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing that instead of having to go to a web server that had all of the files, instead there are all these people all over the world who already have these files and you can find one of them and get a copy of the file from that person. And this is related to the Akamai idea, right? If you're sharing files peer to peer, then there's gonna be a lot of copies out there. You're not gonna have this flash crowd problem. You're not going to, right? A, a, a person who's sharing their files is not gonna to have to give them to thousands of people. They'll just have to give them to two or three people and then those people will also have copies. And that way, nobody will have to serve too many requests. And you know, back then bandwidth was very expensive. Like you didn't want to have to serve lots and lots of copies of your files to other people because it costs too much money. Um, and and it, it ate up all of your bandwidth. So peer-to-peer -peer file sharing was this really popular idea, but it was not being done well. Like the, the problem of finding a copy of the file that you wanted, um, the, the way this worked was that there was some big web server in the middle that kept track of who had all, who had what files. And so everybody would have to contact this centralized directory in order to locate the files that they wanted. And so a very natural academic question was whether you could get rid of that centralized directory and have a true peer-to-peer -peer, uh, service where um, the computers could talk to each other in order to find the things that they wanted to access. Um, and so we set to work on trying to solve that problem. How could you um, set up some kind of distributed directory service that would allow uh, all of these computers uh, to, to, to work together to share files and, and locate information on other computers. Um, and consistent hashing was a very natural place to start from, right? Because it already distributed the files in a nice way among the various computers. Um, but in a sense, peer-to-peer -peer systems was even more uh, anarchic, uh, less control than, than something like Akamai. I mean, Akamai, you know, they were running all of these different web caches. They at least knew that they had a thousand web caches and the content is stored somewhere on those web caches. With peer-to-peer -peer file systems, any computer in the world could be joining this peer-to-peer -peer network. There was no uh, sort of centralized directory of what computers there might be. And so it was a hard problem to decide where is the file that I want. And so building on top of consistent hashing, we developed this technique called CORD, which is basically, it's, called, it's what's called an overlay network. Um, it's a technique where every computer in the system keeps track of a few other computers that are also in the system and relays requests for files to the computers that it knows about. And those computers pass those requests on to other computers and those go on to other computers. And 
eventually this relay of requests gets to a computer that has the file that you want and can send it back to you. Um, the, the challenge is making this relay work efficiently. You, you want to ensure that after just a few relay steps, you reach the computer that you want. Because if you if you spend if you if your relay path is too long, then it, it takes too long for you to get the file. And so I, I don't need to go into the details, I don't think, but we figured out a particular structure called cord, which guaranteed that after a very short relay path, you could find the computer that was responsible for a particular file. The responsibilities were assigned by consistent hashing. And then finding the computer was used was done using this relay process um, with with the overlay network. Uh, great. Yeah. So it's something like putting some overlay. I think this is the problem that you mentioned. Like almost everyone of me is guilty of it. <laughs> like that. This, for example, this website that you want to download some, I mean, movie or music or something. You will click on something and it does not bring it. So the issue is that which one is the valid one? Generally, there's a central one, but this is like a more distributed, essentially even more distributed. Uh, hashing or consistent hashing because the yeah. people are there are lots of computers as well and gotcha. this overlay network i think is you use some kinds of uh, this kind of uh, this uh, like uh, this work of uh, john klemberg in some sense that uh, there are a few hubs that you can reach from any place to any place you can reach essentially a small world phenomena essentially that's right that you can right. uh, use it in some sense and, uh, has it been used i mean or deployed in any software this one yeah, well, you know, peer -to -peer, it, it, it's interesting. Peer-to-peer um, -peer systems, we, we were there right at the beginning when people started. We, we were one of the early uh, groups thinking about peer-to-peer -peer systems. And um, from about 2000 until 2005 or, or something like that, it was a real explosion of an academic research area. It was a research area in computer systems, not in algorithms, yes. but it was very active there were public there were many many publications a conference was founded called the international uh, international iptps the Inf international conference on peer-to-peer -peer systems um, which had hundreds of people attending uh it was very active very energetic there was lots of progress i mean i must have published i don't know maybe 10 papers um on this topic with with all of the colleagues that i've already mentioned uh with Fran, Ari. Uh, Robert and, and Ian in various combinations. Um, but that research area kind of died down um, because people discovered real problems in practice. Uh, the problems were not with the algorithms, the problems were with trust. Um, when you have a very large peer-to-peer -peer system of the sort that these algorithms were being designed for, um, the problem was that it was very easy for malicious actors to join the system and to uh, interfere with this operation. Um, and this also generated many papers about, there was something called the civil attack, which was a, a very important paper that talked yes. about how, how difficult it was to overcome these adversaries. And many papers were published about attempts to overcome these adversaries. But in the end, um, I don't think that this vision of world scale, million computer, peer to peer systems really got realized in practice. I think it might in the future. Like I, I think we, we, we solved a number of really interesting problems and made a lot of things possible. Um, but at the moment at least, um, people seem to be taking more centralized approaches to, to the problems of content distribution that, that peer to peer systems were, were designed to solve. Yeah, I think uh, this uh, civil attack that you mentioned is actually the big <laughs> things that, I mean, like if one user comes and creates lots of essentially copies of That's right. Uh, itself. They, they, they protect uh, the users and they lie about what's available on the system. And because they th these fake users outnumber the so nobody is able to actually uh, trust the content that they have. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, I think that's uh, like the... Uh, it, that's actually this peer-to-peer -peer versus centralized is still the issue. In some sense, maybe the cryptocurrencies is another version, another attempt for that. I think yes. this Web3, if I remember correctly, that's another thing that also the people consider it. And I think the interesting thing about the theory, I will say that, I mean, these are the ideas there. It may, I mean, the technology may die, but theory generally is there. It may right. essentially appear in another thing. Uh, exactly. I, that, that's the point. The, the toolbox is always there. And I know that the, the next time somebody decides that they want to build a large 
uh, distributed system, right? The, the ideas that came out of consistent hashing and out of Cord, they're available and I expect them to be useful for whatever systems people are trying to build. Yeah, and I think I mean, say, I mean, I encourage the people actually, I mean, the people who are working, I think the people who are doing more practice, I think it would be good for them to, I mean, at least see lives like this, essentially to understand some basic theory stuff or read about the theory and vice versa. I think the people who work on theory, I think it is great for them to go and actually learn a little bit of system. Uh, because I really Absolutely. enjoyed like the past two years. I think that's the thing that we will continue with. Like you, exactly the person that, like one of the person that took the theory and then to the considered in the system. And I think this is very important because when you know and learn the system, then, I mean, it may seem complicated, but if you have a theory background, then you will go, you will understand, you will enjoy. And you will see actually that theory that I knew is actually is in practice. I can't Absolutely. even add to that. And I think I want to add on some one particular person. I think I really admire him also, Jeff Deans. I think uh, he has some theory background and some of these big things that he has done is like, I mean, of course, not all of them is done by, uh, like there was a group that he was leading for some of them, but some of them he has done is like, for example, about this uh, map reduce, about big tables. Uh, I think uh, this, uh, what, uh, about TensorFlow, this type of thing that if you have ideas about the theory, you know about the system, you see actually the beautiful world because you have all the toolboxes that you mentioned and these are the problems and you will write the system and it works actually. And that's amazing because uh, that's, I think one of the things that <laughs> like I was, I think I was talking with Anker Moitra, I think a long time ago and he mentioned that uh, I mean, I was doing some plumbing, etc. I said, we are the theory, and I said, I actually like even doing some plumbing. And he mentioned that we are the theoretician, maybe just write the paper. Sometimes that we do real stuff, we really enjoy it. So I think this is the, another place that maybe go to the system. I think that's the thing and understand it. Even, I mean, if you need, if does, you do a little bit of coding, that's not bad as well. You can do, of course, more, but then you will enjoy, actually. You can build something that the people will use it. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I completely agree. I, I think, I, honestly, the, the algorithms work that I have found the most exciting and rewarding has been collaboration with uh, applied researchers. I, I, I love being able to close this loop of taking a practical problem, figuring out an algorithmic problem inside of it, solving that, and then feeding that back to the, the practitioners. And I, sh I should emphasize, like, this did not require me. I, I did not have to learn. I did not have to do any coding. I did not have to learn to code. Um, you know, I'm, I, I can program, but I'm not a great software engineer. But that's not the important part. The important part is having a systems collaborator, right? It, you, you don't have to do it all by yourself. And, you know, it, it was Hari Franz and Robert's students who built the systems that emerged from these algorithmic ideas. But th this collaboration is really essential. I think, you know, as theoreticians, we are not equipped to come up by ourselves with the right problem, with the right questions. Exactly. Okay. The, the questions have to come from the practitioners. Now, I do think that actually the practitioners by themselves also don't always come up with the right questions. It's in the con it's the conversation where this has happened to me over and over again where I sit down with a practitioner and I ask them to explain to me what they're trying to do. And the first explanation is never formal enough. And it's the process of getting them to really, really be specific about what they want. That is the process of design, of defining an interesting algorithmic question. Um, and if they don't talk to the algorithmicist, they may never go through that process of specifying exactly what they want. I think systems people tend to confuse the specification with the implementation. They, 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 they often will talk about what they want in terms, of how the, uh, in terms of how the code runs, instead of talking about it in terms of the result that they want. And I think that talking as an algorithmicist makes it possible to really force them to say exactly what outcome they want. And then you can look at that as an algorithmic problem without any constraints of, you know, what is the implementation going to be? Then of course, when you solve the problem, you need to go back to them and they're gonna tell you that your algorithm does not actually solve the problem. Why doesn't it solve the problem? Well, they forgot to tell you 
something about the constraint and your algorithm is violating the the constraint that their problem needs to solve and so then you do it all over again and you come up with a different algorithm um, but at the end you've converged on an algorithm that can actually solve their problem and then again it's a collaboration you need to explain that algorithm so that they can actually implement it and, yeah. and do the experiment yeah, actually, I am glad. I mean, I have done it. Like, for example, this type of thing with the big tech, like for example, at AT and T or Google or like Microsoft, uh, and actually at uh, Amazon that I was there. I think that was like this type of collaboration. Actually, during that time of Amazon, it's like good or bad. They didn't have any research team when I was there, so it means that you were actually working more with it. There is no research. There are some practitioners. These are all product teams, and this, I mean, like. At the beginning, maybe it's a bit, I mean, uh, frightening. Okay, <laughs> no, I mean, you need to do the product thing. But uh, that, I will say, even actually one step further. So uh, I, did, I think the good things nowadays about Python. Python actually is a, like a beautiful language. It's very high level. There are lots of modules that you can do their stuff. And I will say, even if you go one, uh, even if you talk with practitioner, sometimes, okay, this is something that they understand better. Interestingly, if you just spend, I will say maybe like, I will say probably one year or maybe one or year or two. You spend I'm not all the time. Just try to understand. Maybe read some codes or something like it. That actually, at some point, you will see that you may understand the problem even better. Some of them, and mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. and you will enjoy even more because some of these. I mean, you always say these are the things that I don't know, or maybe I. This is something that when you don't know. At least I feel that I'm afraid of it. Maybe it's something complicated. But when you go and see, oh, these are all nice ideas that have been used and that's like a beautiful. Like for me, it happened that some of this, I thought about it and they have even written the code for that. And later on, there's actually this code that I have written, for example, is, this is very similar to, for example, Kafka or similar, very similar to Redis or like Kubernetes type of ideas. And oh, these people have just used this idea and then made the big things out of it. So I think that's beautiful. I really enjoyed that. And I think if you have time as a theoretician, I think that might be, and if you are interested, of course, in applying your stuff, even going one step further, read a little bit about the system things and know what's happening that will be really, I mean, I really enjoyed. Yeah, I mean, I, in general, I have found that, I mean, you, you if you find the right collaborator, right? I, I mean, reading is good, but talking is better. Like, yes, uh, like sure. the conversations, and it's, it's, I've always found it really quite easy. Like you find a practitioner and you ask them, what are you doing that is too slow or that exactly. is using too much memory, right? And they will tell you, here's the problem I'm trying to solve and it's taking too much time. And that is all you need to start a conversation which will often lead to an interesting algorithms problem. Yeah, I think there are the processes reading, talking, and I will say the last one doing also, at least a little bit of that yourself. I think mean, that mm -hmm. would be a great thing. Uh, great. So I think if we talk about, I mean, this aspect of your work that you, I mean, talk essentially theory problems and then you put it in practice and talk with the practitioner. I think we, I want to now go to more things like Kai. So I think for some time, I say, okay, David <laughs> Gargan is working more practical and like this uh, type of uh, human interaction computers, these are a bit far from the networking stuff that they're similar. So tell us about that. Why did you take that direction? What are the things that you are excited about those works? Sure, sure. So I, I can say that um, I actually started doing HCI research at the same time as I started graduate school because what happened was that while I was in graduate school, I, I, I found summer internships. And the, the summer internships were at Xerox Park. And um, at Xerox Park, I worked with, um, uh, Doug Cutting and uh, Jan Peterson uh, on information retrieval problems. Um, and, and sometimes with John Tukey, actually. I, I'm, I'm a co-author with John Tukey, which is pretty awesome given that he founded modern statistics. Um, but um, we were studying problems around helping people navigate large document databases and find what they wanted. And we, we did early work on, on clustering document collections and browsing document collections. Um, and I published those papers in like 1992 and 1993 at the same time as I was publishing my, my theory papers from graduate school, I was doing this information retrieval work um, at Xerox Park. 
Xerox Park is, of course, the place that you know created a lot of the uh, of, of the PC experience that we have nowadays, windowing systems and mice and all of these things came out of Xerox Park uh, before I got there. But it was they still had a great the, lab, like Bell Labs, I think, at some point of your great research labs. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, so it was a wonderful opportunity to work there. And that really stimulated my interest in just how people work with information. And so even again, as soon as I got to MIT, I expected that my primary work was going to be theoretical computer science, but I also started uh, research on uh, tools to help people manage information. Um, and at the time, I didn't really know any human computer interaction, but uh, over the years, I kind of picked it up uh, as I went along. So um, I, I initially started working with Lynn Stein, who was a, another professor at MIT, um, uh, and we, we, we developed some systems together. And basically what happened over the years was that that work on HCI got bigger and bigger and it sort of squeezed out the work that I do on theoretical computer science. Um, the, the HCI work is applied work, it's systems work, it means having a large group of students um, uh, do, uh, and, and, and just sort of, it, it's, it's somewhat counter to the sort of theoretical computer science model where you just have one or two students at a time and you work with them very closely. Um, so for a while I was doing both at once. I had my theory students and I had my HCI students. Um, but uh, since Bernard Haupler, who graduated, I think in 2012 or something like that, I haven't really had any theory students um, and I've just been doing research in human computer interaction um, uh, with, with, with my group. Um, why the shift? So, so it was a few different things. Uh, partially it was just that the, the HCI problems were big and, and took a lot of students and took a lot of time. Um, but also I think I've always just really, it, I'm really, um, it, it's a big payoff for me when I feel like I am solving problems to help people. And in HCI, you're really think you're you're really almost directly connected to the people that you're helping. You 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 have very concrete problems that people have, and you're building tools, and you can sort of envision the person who is going to be happier because they have this new tool that you were able to build. Um, now, ironically, because of the particular theory work that I've done, right, I probably had more practical impact from my theory work because of things like, uh, like Akamai, but it's a very diffuse kind of impact. Like everybody is loading web pages a little bit faster. It's kind of hard to point at somebody and say, yes, I've made that person better off. Like we, we, we contribute a lot of productivity gains, things that make the economy work better and so forth, but it's not like we've made any individuals happier. And sort of HCI, there's more of this feeling that you're, you're addressing specific human needs and, 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 and helping people. Um, and especially most recently, a lot of my research in HCI nowadays has shifted to looking at online discussion platforms and social media. And that is because I'm actually really worried about the future if we don't fix uh, if, if we don't fix social media, I, I really feel like computer science has created a grave existential threat to humanity. Um, and, right? You can't the, talk the, more about it, about these controversial right? things. Yeah. The, the, the polarization, the misinformation that's out there, the surveillance that's out there. I really think that there's a risk uh, to, to all of humanity if we don't fix what's there now. And so, like I still really enjoy thinking about theory problems, but it feels almost like a luxury that I don't have. That like these theory problems, okay, maybe they'll have an impact someday in 30 years, but I'm not certain that we have 30 years if we don't do something about the, 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 the web that people are experiencing now. And so I'm really motivated to, to try to, to do something that will, uh, that will make a difference uh, in, in the short term. It, it, it's not that I discount long-term research and the kind of research that theoreticians do, but I, I really am a little bit worried that there might not be a long-term uh, if, if, if we don't make some changes in the short term. 
Yeah, I think you don't like exactly the thing that I mentioned, this impact essentially that you will see it. Like the theory, I mean, you are doing that. I mean, we are doing and this is nice, but the impact, I mean, sometimes as you mentioned, like this one, come on, but you may not see the direct impact. I think in, in particular case of uh, this, uh, uh, like uh, HCI, you will see even the impact more because you are again, uh, uh, like, talking with the people and get the feedback from them. And I'm sure that you are, actually this is one of the things that I have done it like, I was like back in 2000, I was working on some kind of Robocop competitions. And at that time I didn't write essentially any, uh, like I didn't prove any theorem, but I'm sure that you use these ideas of in, like theory or even more important, I mean like the way of thinking in solving this problem. I think that's the same process is not that much different when you solve a practical problem, but it's the same mindset. I mean, you try to somehow make the problem to, into a nice component and then solve each of them, paste them together. Yes. I think that's the way that we are doing in theory because we yes. just train the brain in some sense. Now you will apply it for something else and it can be great things that. I agree, I agree. I think that. I think that a that theoretical training is really great for helping you uh, be able to model problems, to, to, to be able to define the problem that you're trying to solve very precisely. And defining the problem you want to solve very precisely is a really important step to solving that problem. Um, in my experience in HCI, it's it's very rare that I'm able to, that that I pull something out of the algorithms toolbox to get an, an efficient algorithm. Because honestly, in the kind of work that I do, efficiency is not really a bottleneck. It, like getting things to run fast, like they're, they're fast enough on regular computers using regular techniques. The, the space they use is small. We don't need to be efficient, to be super efficient in the way we use it. So it's not that I'm using algorithmic techniques, but I am definitely using an algorithmic way of defining problems that need to be solved and thinking about what sort of structures will solve. Uh, I will say, I think there is an objective function. Maybe the objective function is not time, but something else. I think that's the one that you try oh, to somehow. Uh, I, I wish there was an objective function. I mean, sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. Um, you know, we, we, we developed a, a tool called Wickham, which is um, designed to to, to improve large scale discussions by allowing the people who are participating in the discussion to summarize the whole discussion. Um, and the technique that we developed is called recursive summarization. The idea is that you find one person, you give them 10 posts and you ask them to write a summary of the 10 posts. And then you find somebody else and you give them 10 posts and you ask them to write a summary of the 10 posts. And basically each person is summarizing 10 posts and it's, it's kind of like the contraction algorithm, right? Every time you write a summary, the discussion gets a little bit smaller. And so you just apply this procedure over and over again. And eventually the whole discussion is summarized down to a single small document. And so, you know, this is not about analyzing the runtime or anything like that, but it is clearly a kind of divide and conquer recursive sort of algorithm where the idea comes from the algorithms toolbox. Yeah, I will say when the graph things will come that how do you want to even, I mean, do this type of, I mean, from this guy to want to give it to which guy, because then also there might be some priority to give based on the history, et cetera, that. Oh, you, you, you can definitely define some interesting theory problems. Like I, I've done work on crowdsourcing um, where, where we generated, I think, some very interesting algorithms problems uh, by looking at the way crowdsourcing work was done. But, but again, here, that wasn't the goal. The goal was to just develop a, a workflow, a, a process that would eventually lead to a summary. And we weren't really trying to optimize time or space or anything like that. And sometimes it's even, uh, th there's really no objective function. Like another project that I'm very enthusiastic about is this, this system we built called NB, which is a tool for classroom discussion. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we all, all of us in universities are familiar with, you know, the discussion forums like Piazza where students can ask questions and get answers and such. Um, but our idea there was that in a lot of classes, there are reading materials and a lot of the questions that the students have are about the reading materials. So our, our insight there was to actually move the discussion forum into the reading materials. So all of the conversations actually happen in the margins of the document. 
And that means that if you're reading something and you're confused, you don't have to go to Piazza and try and find somebody who asked that question already. And, and had, instead, you just look in the margins next to the part of the document that's confusing you. And that's where somebody else probably asked a question about that part of the document. And you can get unconfused just by looking with, without leaving your place. So um, we think that this is a much better way to structure classroom discussions. And we, we launched this, this tool, NB. Uh, uh, Sorry, what was the name? It's called NB. It's, it's still running at, at nb.mit.edu, actually. Um, and at this point, we've got about 2 million comments from students all over the world. Um, and um, uh, it's been used by hundreds of classes around the world in everything from archaeology to philosophy to physics to zoology. Like, all sorts of classes use have used NB for discussion. And in this tool, there's no theory here, right? We're not trying to optimize anything. It's just we thought of a better way to organize the information and a better way to present it to the user. And th these are fundamental problems in human computer interaction. Um, so yeah, yeah. sometimes, sometimes, sometimes box makes a difference. And sometimes I'm just doing human computer interaction. Uh, yeah, that's actually I mean, a, a great thing. So uh, like uh, this one that uh, nb at dot mit dot edu, I think that's the one that the people can use it. That one, I think that was for more uh, like the putting somehow, like in some sense you hold, I mean, let me say my understanding and ask question about it because actually they are ex very exciting to me. These are, again, for me, ideas are ideas. It can be theory ideas or it can be anything else. And that yes. can be very interesting. So in some sense, you will consider the whole document and you try to, I mean, we can put the comments, for example, in the PDF. So in some sense, the people can come and put the comments and such that they make this document more readable in some sense by That's some right. kind of collaborative way. Yes. Of doing now, that. First Putting it in the PDF, but like, like you want it to be to be interactive, right? You, you like a PDF is not a document that everybody can share and be annotating at the same time, right? A PDF document, like one person has a copy and they can annotate it and send it to somebody else, but you can't have everybody in the class asking questions and seeing everybody's comments at the same time. So NB actually, you upload PDF documents or web pages, but then NB provides a separate space to store those comments and uh, attach them uh, to the PDF documents that people are reading online. So in that sense, it would be more similar to Google Doc, because in Google Doc, also different exactly. people can come. Exactly. It is, it is more similar to Google Docs. That's right. Uh, great. Uh, and is there any, I think, uh, what are the distinguished uh, terms between that and uh, Google Doc? Well, so uh, remember, we started this project in 2010. So oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> young, right? Yeah. Um, and our system is really designed for the classroom, right? It has a model of instructors and students, right? And instructors have a different view of the discussion than the students do. Uh, students can ask questions anonymously uh, because that turns out to be a very important in the classroom uh, because students are shy. Um, we added functionality that is specifically relevant to the classroom, uh, like instructor endorsement, uh, which is something that you see on Piazza, right? That instruct you want instructors to be able to say, these are really good comments, or these are really the, the right answer. Um, instructors wanted ways to grade the comments. Uh, we added functionality for incorporating uh, various kinds of emoji that the students can use to represent their, their state. Like, are they confused or are they interested? Uh, do they have a question that needs answering? Um, and mechanisms to filter the comments, to direct students to the questions that need answering or to direct instructors to places where students are confused. Um, we, we looked at ways to use the, the, like the, the, the sections that are being annotated by the students, they get highlighted in the document. And so it's, we, we provide ways for the instructors to kind of see where the, where the concentration where, right, where are the students having more discussion and where are they having less discussion? Um, and more recently, we've been doing work on using machine learning to try to identify student confusion uh, from the Sorry, comments. To, uh, ident to identify what? Student confusion uh, from the comments that they post. Um, also from an educational perspective, it often turns out to be useful, like if a, if a class is being taught again, um, it often turns out to be useful to repost comments from previous years. 
uh, that have been helpful to students. And we've explored work using machine learning to identify the right comments to carry over from year to year. So, I mean, MB has been an active research project for about 10 years, and we have many different uh, directions that we've taken it far beyond Google Docs at this point. Uh, great. So, and uh, what was the, did you have a website also for this summarization as well? Uh, yes, that's a website called Wickham. Um, and uh, I think it's offline at the moment because of an expired uh, web certificate, but yeah. we're planning to take care of that and um, uh, get, get it back up uh, quickly online. So if we, you put we try it, type in, it, I think I can. Okay, so uh, this one, so the previous one was nb.mit.edu and this one is uh, wikum.org. That's, That's right. Uh, we come uh, and we, in, in my HCI research, we try very, very hard to um, get all of our projects up and like deployed where people can actually use them. I mean, part of this is again, my motivation to try to do things that help people. Like I, I feel that the tools that we build, I mean, we, we, we build tools that I'm really excited about, uh, tools that help protect people against online harassment, um, tools that help people who are not programmers create their own applications on the web. Um, and uh, sort of in, in all of these domains, I really feel like they can help people. And so I'd like to put them up uh, so that people can use them and hopefully can benefit from them. Uh, uh, great. So uh, are there some other projects? I mean, because uh, that's actually, uh, so is this uh, harassment or other type of things? Have you built anything so far or have you published any work on those? Oh, projects? absolutely. Um, we have a project called Squadbox. Um, which, yeah, Squadbox, actually, that's another one that I wanted to ask yeah, you. So squadbox.org, yeah. You may want to tell a little bit about that. that I really care about because, you know, again, I've, social, so online, social media spaces are so horrible right now. Um, and, and there are many people who are facing a lot of, of, of really horrible harassment. Um, and we had an idea for helping to protect people from it. And it's ideal that I think that I thought was really good and I still think is really good and that I really want to get out there. Um, we, we approach this as a real HCI problem. In, in HCI in general, you don't start by building tools. You actually start by interviewing uh, users. You, you, uh, you, you interview people who have the problem so that you can understand the problem before you start building a solution. Yeah, actually, um, that's a way that I think that's a way of creating any startup. That's a, I think if you go oh, to iCorp or others, that's exactly the way that you need to do it. 100 or like 20 or 100 people you need to interview exactly. before creating anything. Yeah, exactly. So we interviewed uh, many people who were facing harassment online to try and understand what the problems were and to understand what the solutions were. And um, one solution that kept coming up was that people would often, people facing harassment, would often give up, give their friends the passwords to their accounts and ask their friends to sign in and remove all of the harassment. Um, and this is very, very powerful because a lot of harassment is directed at an individual and it's really not harmful to other people. Um, and so it's something that a friend can do and we found that it is something that friends are very eager to do. Um, but this technique of, having, of giving friends your password is also really problematic because um, it gives them access to everything. Uh, there are real privacy issues um, to your friends having all of your passwords. Also, um, there's a time to like, maybe your friend logs in in the morning and removes all of the harassment, but then new harassment arrives before you look at your content in the evening. So we built a tool that really is designed to support friends who are uh, doing this intervention. Um, we designed it around email. It's essentially a platform where you can redirect incoming email to go to Squadbox, where it will be moderated by your friends and then sent back to your email account. So you can keep using your email and um, email that comes from strangers and uh, you, you can have, a, you can have a, a, an allow list of, of people who go directly to you, but anybody who's not in your allow list that email gets rerouted to Squadbox, and Squadbox has a lot of nice infrastructure. It's basically a moderation platform where your friends can come in, can see what's in the moderation queue, they can look at it, they can decide what should be with it. Some people want your want their harassment deleted, other people just want it moved to a separate folder or tagged in certain ways. And Squadbox supports all of that. Um, 
And, uh, you know, we built this system and uh, people really, the, the, the people who were, the, the Rassman victims really, really liked the idea. We ran some user studies that went very well. Um, and this is something that I really would like to see get out there because I think it can make a real difference. Like there's so much work being done now where you expect the platforms to moderate, right? But the platforms don't know the person. And we, what we found in our interviews is that harassment is often very, very targeted. A lot of people are getting harassed based on things that do, like if you just read the text, it does not look like harassment at all. It's based on secret things that the harasser knows about the individual, right? And the other sort of things that the platforms cannot possibly detect, okay? And the platforms are in general very unresponsive to uh, complaints, right? So I really think we need something else I think Squadbox can really be a part of the solution, and I'd, I'd like to see it get out there. So yeah, that's, that's actually a, really a great thing. So let me, I mean, get a little bit. I mean, <laughs> my understanding on that one. So I think you are using the fact that I mean, I think you mentioned that that uh, like if some sentence is there, maybe I mean, the, like the person under harassment, that person may un they feel very bad about that, and it is very individual. A friend may not feel that. I, that bad. I think that's the reason that uh, for a friend, he can or she can just come and delete that without feeling bad. But I don't want to go even see that before deleting it because that's also some mental pressure on me. So I think that's yeah. the assumption that you are using here. And the other issue is that uh, whether you are assuming, for example, the friend knows about the issue of harassment or not, because I think yeah. that also is important because a platform cannot do that because does not know what is inside the harassment. And you assume exactly that I think so the friend about, knows about it. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly, that's exactly what is so important. It's about you know your close friends are the ones who are best equipped to know whether something is harassment or not. Great. Because they so know so much about like an uh, intermediary person is not, platform does not know about it. And probably you don't want to even mention to any platform is that. I mean, a, a friend and, actually, and they, you basically- I mean, even, if you, even if you mention it to them, they, at that scale, there's no way they can, like, you can't tell the platform, oh, you know, I was once in an abusive relationship and I don't want to hear about, it. But they do not personalize things in that way. Exactly. But uh, here also, I mean, a friend is somehow that he, he knows uh, or she knows about the problem, but it's not that much affected so he can go and delete it. Uh, exactly. He has some knowledge, essentially. And it's also more private way. Not all yes. words know about it. That's Who right. knows? Maybe it's you also, will mention. I mean, Squawbox is also doing load balancing, right? If we want to talk about theory, right? Yeah. You have many friends and no one of them has to deal with all of the harassment. Instead, you spread out the harassment among the many friends, right? Yes, exactly. So actually, one, of, one of the interesting things that we discovered about harassment is that it's very intermittent. You, you have spikes. So today, somebody gets harassed a lot and then the rest of the week, they don't get harassed a lot. So you can have a bunch of friends who are protecting each other and that provides a natural load balancing system that whoever is getting harassed today, they rely on their friends. And then tomorrow they are acting to protect their friends instead. Yeah, these are actually beautiful ideas because these are the some of sort of things that exactly you mentioned, the way that you will go and create a startup. And have you made any startups out of any of them? Of course, there are websites there, but. So, you know, as I mentioned with Akamai, right? Danny Lewin and Tom Layton really carried this company forward and I just sort of went along as a researcher. And the reason for that is that I don't think I'm really, uh, I don't really have the right personality to create startups because there's a lot more to creating a startup than just figuring out a clever idea. Yeah, exactly. You, and you need that you team essentially market, doing that. You have to market that idea. You have to meet deadlines. There's all of these things that you have to do in a successful startup that Danny in particular was just amazing at um, in order, but, but watching him do it just made it really clear to me that I was not cut out to be that person who is leading a startup. And so, you know, I've, I've tried to instead take the sort of the open source route uh, of just sort of put it out there and hopefully people will use it. And again, with NB, this has been reasonably successful. You know, we didn't do any marketing, but just by word of mouth, we ended up with 60,000 users uh, of the platform, right? Um, now, I still think that it should be possible to do this by open source, 
and, and, and just by word of mouth, but companies have more resources. And I think if you really want to get something out there and get it widespread, right? The, the, the company approach is a very powerful way to do that. And so, you know, I, I would, you know, if there were people who wanted to pick up these ideas and make companies, uh, so actually, sometimes that happens. Like actually, um, uh, there's a group called, there, there's a company called Perusal, um, which was founded from the ideas of NB. Um, to sort of do, and, and this is a for-profit company. Uh, and similarly, there's a, there's a company called Block Party, um, which is applying some of the squad box ideas to Twitter. Okay, so, you know, I think as an academic, you can have influence in, in, in directly and indirectly, right? If you really, if you're really inspired by your idea, you can found a company and go out there and make it happen. Um, you know, or you can just try and make the idea widely enough known that somebody else will pick it up and, and found that company. Yeah, exactly. These are the research part of uh, I mean, that. I mean, that's, we are essentially glad that we can research in anything without like somehow forced to create that one. So hopefully others can come and pick up. These are nice ideas. Any, uh, any more ideas also about this other kind of biased opinion or something? Have you made anything there? Because that was yeah, another yeah, thread yeah, that yeah, you mentioned. Yeah, we created a tool called TrustNet. Um, uh, which, so that TrustNet, again, is a project I'm really excited about. And it's trying to do something that I think the platforms are just getting completely wrong. So we have this, we have this horrible plague of misinformation and the platforms are trying to solve it at the platform level. Like they're hiring a bunch of moderators and those moderators are trying to block misinformation and just isn't working, right? Or they're trying to apply machine learning yes, to identify, and that isn't working either, okay? And I think that the platforms have left out the most important ingredient in human interaction, which is trust, right? So um, a funny story, about 10 years ago, I started getting a lot of anti-vax information in my Facebook feed. From, from people claiming that vaccines don't work so far. Why was I getting that information? I was getting that information because one of my friends who's a doctor was commenting on anti-vaxxer posts and explaining why they were wrong. Yeah. What did Facebook do about that? Facebook said, ooh, your friends are commenting on this post. We're gonna share it with you also because you're gonna be interested in this post because your friends were interested in this post. Okay. So my friend who was trying to prevent the spread of vaccine information was instead, of, oh. was instead causing the spread of vaccine misinformation. Now, what should have happened was that my friend should have been able to say, this is wrong, don't share it, right? And you know, I trust that friend. Like if that friend tell, says something is wrong, I don't want to see it. But there was no way for me to tell Facebook that. So we have created this platform called TrustNet, which is designed to do exactly that. Everybody who registers on TrustNet has the ability to assess information as true or false. And they also have the ability to say, who do they trust on the platform? And then they can set filters and say, if, any, if people that I trust say this information is false, then don't show it to me. Great. And TrustNet creates a feed of information that you can control. You can filter out all of the information that has been assessed as false by people that you trust. Um, you can also, I mean, there's various settings on the filter. You can also look for information that's controversial, where some of your friends say it's true and some of your friends say it's false. Uh, there, there's, it's, it's a very powerful platform. It also comes with a browser extension. So you can install this browser extension in Chrome and Anytime you visit a web page, you can right there on the page add an assessment of whether it's accurate or inaccurate. And any one of your friends who's visiting that web page will see that assessment. And if that web page is linked in your Facebook feed or in your Twitter feed, and your friends say that it's wrong, our tool will remove it from your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed. Okay. And that's and what so, actually exactly when you mentioned. I mentioned that is there any like uh, like the one that you mentioned, for example, for extension Chrome, uh, Chrome extension, and you mentioned that you made it exactly the right way. Uh, 
great. And uh, so uh, uh, one question. So uh, whether this, I think we were talking about this one, uh, trustnet.csail.mit.edu. Uh, so uh, the, this one, uh, do you uh, here, do we have a social network on Trustnet itself or it is more yes. like overlaying on others? Well, I mean, this is one of those cases where, you know, as researchers, what we would really like to do is do an intervention on Facebook, right? Or do an intervention on Twitter, but they're not cooperating, right? They, they do not provide the kind of APIs that would allow us to manipulate content directly on those exactly. sites. So we had to build our own site as a demonstration of the ideas. And that's what Trustnet is. So Trustnet is kind of a demonstration of what Facebook could look like if it incorporated these ideas of trust and assessment of content. And my goal is to someday convince the social media networks that they need to incorporate trust and assessment um, in order to deal with this plague of misinformation that we're currently facing, right? Um, but we can't make them do it. And so, you know, we, I, you know I don't expect, you know, with, with, with social media networks, you have these, uh, these network effects, right? It's going to be very difficult to convince everybody to switch from Facebook to Trustnet, yes. right? Um, because all of their friends are on Facebook and their friends are not on Trustnet, right? So we have these usual lock-in problems for, for, for social media. Um, and so I don't know if, trust, if the Trustnet platform itself is going to be able to draw in users. Now, the browser extensions, there I have hope, right? Because the browser exactly. extensions work wherever you are, and they, they intervene in your Facebook feed, in your Twitter feed, to, to be able to, to manipulate them right there. So I have yeah. some hope that we'll be able to attract users to that. And it's something that we're interested, that we're trying to do right now. We've been running some user studies. We've just gotten the paper accepted to uh, the CSW conference. Um, Again, this is a problem that I care about a lot, that I think it's a huge and important problem to solve, and where I think that we have a valuable step towards a solution. And so I'm very eager to figure out how to drive adoption, how to inspire people to, uh, to try out the school, to contribute assessments. And if anybody has ideas, I'd love to hear from them. Yeah, I think uh, uh, beautiful. Yeah, I think I'm very happy. I mean, the people who might be interested in essentially funding a startup or other thing, that would be great things. Because I think potentially it is some of the thing that if you have it, I mean, hopefully one of these big guys, they should actually buy the, that one and then add it to their uh, platform this, to make this it. This is where I'm very worried, right? Is that um, in order to fund a startup, you have to have a business case, right? Uh, you have to have yes. a uh, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I am not convinced that there is a business case for squad box or for trust that certainly like in our advertising dominated ecosystem right something like trustnet is a problem because it encourages people not to look at content right it is, it is sort of the opposite of what the social platforms want um and so i'm not certain like like if you if you could get a subscription model going like you get people to actually pay you ten dollars a month for uh, assessments, that might work. That might but be. I think that in the end, these sorts of things might have to happen more in a nonprofit kind of space. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tom, I mean, uh, to add to that, for example, uh, you know, uh, this is somehow similar to this idea about these kinds of cookies that the, the websites are putting there essentially, and then the others are using it to show advertisement. Mm -hmm. And this is like the Apple iOS. That's the one that the first essential event is a cookie-less world. Now, Facebook is yes. in trouble because they were using a lot of that or even Google. Google actually planned to have this cookie-less world, I think, 2020, but then they delayed it because right. also that some part of their profit essentially was under uh, issues. So they yes. want to do uh, Chrome essentially cookie-less. And essentially means that they don't want to give their... Private information, this is more like differential privacy. They will give just some very bulk information to the others that they can use it. But, but yes. the issue that is privacy issues, I mean, now it's a big thing. Now everyone in the advertisement talk about cookie list world and how can they create something that they can use that one. And at the same time, I think if you know that this is not a, by default, you need to create it, then you will be more careful. Maybe the next things, still the people want to use, to show, to see advertisement because that is, instead of getting, I mean, paying essentially subscriptions or others. 
to one way or other. But then you have more control. That is my things. And that, yeah, that, that, I mean, that is probably the most important theme in the research that I'm doing is giving the users more control, right? Uh, squad yeah. box is about letting users control their harassment. And TrustNet is about letting people make their own decisions to protect themselves from misinformation. And that, that, that is a common theme in a, in a lot of the projects that we're doing. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I mean, this comes essentially, maybe I'm not at the beginning, but like a Facebook, if I go and see lots of unwanted things, I mean, that I see actually at Facebook, then uh, I mean, and it may not come to the Facebook. So in some sense, uh, you may think that at the beginning they want to do that, but you just consider essentially flooding things. If everyone, every information go to everyone, then nobody will use that one because we can. Yes. So in some sense, it, there should be such process that essentially filter out and those that I really wanted, I should get it. And I think that's a great idea that you will tag some of your friends and say, that I will trust them, not anyone. Maybe there are some others in my network, but even I don't trust them that much. Because they, everybody they just, has some crazy relatives that they have to be friends with, but that they don't trust. Right. Exactly. And this, that's actually a great idea that you can just tag them and those information will come and get it. That's actually a beautiful thing. But as you mentioned, this is the issue with this uh, type of things that uh, I think you may consider it actually as a SaaS business and sell it to the others. I think that would be the correct way that something on the, I mean, as a service essentially that will be sold to Twitter or other things that the people can use it and. It could uh, be. I mean, certainly Squadbox, I, I, I mean, again, the, the problem is integration, right? Like integrate, like the, these platforms in general do not provide the kind of APIs that are needed exactly. to integrate these tools. And so you need to get the attention of these platforms and convince them that what you have is worth uh, incorporating. And that's very difficult. Uh, uh, great. And uh, also one other uh, thing. So uh, have you done anything for the K-12? I think you mentioned about this classroom stuff is there i think i saw some other k-12 learning oh, well, and stuff and nb is the focus of our education research and that has primarily been used in in universities but i mean it would work just fine in high school classrooms as well right any any time that there's reading material for students to discuss um and nb makes that makes that easier and and more effective mm, great uh, okay, so uh, that's great. No, and let me I'll just uh, add I mean, some few questions, like if maybe there's a quick answer, essentially, and then we can sure. I mean, essentially finish that. So uh, I think uh, one uh, like uh, interesting thing, so this we talk about a little bit about the uh, theory. I think somebody also asked about this question. Uh, how do you think about like uh, BP is equal to P? Like essentially randomization with their helps uh, like, do we have a stronger classes randomization or not? I think when I was at MIT 2000, the people believe that in 10 years that should be resolved. It's still, I don't think that maybe in the next 20, 30 years it will be resolved. Uh, this is like P versus not MP again, that now maybe yeah. the people expect well, more. You know, but how do you feel about that question? So it probably doesn't surprise you given what I've said about my orientation to practice, but right, I, I rarely think about the sort of, you know, really deep theoretical complexity theoretic uh, questions. Um, because like, even if they are resolved, I mean, sorry, I'm sure it will have important practical consequences if they are resolved, but it won't have the obvious consequences. Like suppose, you know, if people come along and prove that P equals NP, right? I suspect that it will be true theoretically, but not practically. And like what, whatever transformation they do, you know, I don't think that the proof of P equals NP will suddenly let people uh, crack all the cryptographic or something. Yeah. right? So I think it will have very important ramifications in theory, which may eventually lead to practical ramifications, but I think of it as sort of separate questions. Um, similarly, I think that you know, the question of whether BP equals P, BP equals P, you know, is randomization useful? Um, you know, given the amazing things that people have managed to do with de-randomization, I would not be shocked if BPP equals P. That is, I, I think it is possible that, you know, P is sufficiently limited in power that you can fool polynomial time algorithms with good pseudo random number generators. But even if that turns out to be the case, right, we've seen over and over again that the, the slowdown, the cost of de-randomizing is very high. So that, you know, you have all of these algorithms which use randomization in practice in very important ways, you know, quicksort, 
right? Proving that VPP is equal to P is not going to change the fact that quicksort is the algorithm that everybody wants to use to sort. You're gonna keep on using that randomized algorithm, even though we have a theoretical proof that randomization doesn't make a difference. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, okay, so and, uh, one other thing, by the way, this is actually Harris stuff. I think one other interesting thing that I remember, uh, like whenever, I, I think when I came for graduate students, uh, I didn't, uh, like you were, I think, the only person that you had this ball in the room, you all standing or essentially on the ball. Do you have a, still that ball in your room? And are I you do, working? I that? still have that ball. I still do a lot of standing when I work. Um, I've actually, for the past couple of years, been dealing with some rather serious foot problems. I, I, I dance. I've, I've been dancing for 35 yeah. years. And at this point, my, one of my feet has, has run into a lot of trouble. And so uh, there are quite a few times when standing is too painful and then I have to work sitting down. Um, also in the pandemic, um, I got more used to sitting on my couch, um, but I, I've since bought a standing desk at home also. And I, I do try to stand, it's, it's much healthier. Um, but for example, I, I did this interview seated because when I stand, I walk around. And um, if I walked around, you wouldn't be able to hear me on the microphone. Yeah, exactly. Actually, this is one of the things that I think probably, I mean, I think nowadays it's like this kind of adjustable table is more often essentially yes. the people yes. that use it. But at that time, not too many people. I think you were unique in that sense. And actually you had also some great uh, Persian music that sometime I had it when you were <laughs> working and you had the music and this one, I remember uh, yes. that as well. Uh, so that's a uh, great, so. Uh, Although one, okay. one of my students wrote me one better. Jamie T. Van was kind of, was in some ways my first HCI student and she's now, she's now a chief scientist at Microsoft, but she has a treadmill desk. So, so she doesn't okay. just stand, she actually has a treadmill that makes okay. her walk. <laughs> that's much, much harder, yeah. I think I still, I try to get, I mean, used to it like standing, but yeah, they're, they're, like walking on treadmill is much more dangerous. I mean, I'm going to treadmill, but actually I don't try to do anything there. I just listening or watching something. Uh, great. So I think just uh, one thing is about like, what are your like the best, uh, like the wishes essentially? I think you mentioned some of them, for example, this one that they, you believe that actually it may attack our society about this kind of biased uh, in, bias propagation of some ideas or this kind of harassment, these are the tools that we created. And I think you hope that we can somehow limit them or find a solution that does not allow that. So these or other things, do you have any other like th in theory or practice? I mean, you want that you solve it or someone else solve it. I think that would be interesting. Like All right. vision. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll mention a couple of things. The, the, the reason that I'm here right now uh, in, in Jerusalem is that I've been giving some talks on uh, some recent work I did on network reliability. Um, and so like, I don't have theory students anymore, but every once in a while I publish a theory paper. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. And, and, and so um, network reliability is actually one of these problems. I was part of that first paper, the, 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 the paper that, in, that introduced the, the minimum cut algorithm also talked a little bit about network reliability. And that's a problem that I kept working on in my career. I developed the first approximation algorithm for it in uh, 1998 or something like that. Um, and um, it sort of sat around for a while, but in 2014, there was a new paper by Harrison Srinivasan that, that improved on it. And it got me thinking about the problem again. And I, I published a couple of papers on network reliability and I've made a lot of progress, but I have a few ideas for how to really finish like really, you know, get the, uh, you know, it's a quadratic time algorithm now. I think I can get it down to linear. Um, and so I, I really would like, because that's one of the problems I started my career with. I kind of like to finish that problem. To finish off that one. As well. and, um, and, and, but, can you just define it maybe briefly? What, uh, sure. what is the it? network reliability problem is saying if you have a network and every edge is going to fail with some probability, you're interested in knowing the probability that that network will become disconnected. So it's again, it's a, it's a disconnection problem, right? Um, but now you're not intentionally disconnecting the network. Instead, you're asking about the likelihood that it's going to be become disconnected if there are these random failures. And I think it's pretty obvious how this is a, a natural and important problem to ask in practice. Um, now in, in practice though, it, it's often the vertices that are failing as opposed to the edges. Yeah. But even the edge failure problem I think has, has meaning in practice. Um, and, and so, um, that turns out to be a very difficult problem to get an exact answer for. It's sharp P hard, uh, it's, it's sharp P complete. 
Um, and so the, 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 what people have been working on is developing good algorithms for quickly finding approximations to the reliability, uh, to, to that probability of disconnection. So that's kind of my, my remaining pet theory problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, another, another theory problem, or the, the, a theory wish that I have, and this is not something I'm working on at all, is that in the past decade, there's been a tremendous amount of progress on the core graph optimization problems like max flow um, using algebraic techniques, um, using spectral methods. Yes. And I do not believe in those methods in the yeah. same way that- <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I can actually, yeah. In, in the same way that Albert Einstein didn't believe in quantum mechanics. Like yeah. they work, right? Like they, they absolutely work. You cannot deny that these spectral methods have led to the best algorithms for these problems. But to me, they just don't feel like the right algorithms. I, Not at least the clean algorithm. Maybe they are much nicer and cleaner algorithms. Exactly. I really feel like there ought to be beautiful combinatorial algorithms for these uh, fundamental problems like maximum flow. And that is, so that's a dream. It's not something I'm working on because again, I don't have the mathematical sophistication to be able to tackle the spectral algorithms. And I think whoever comes up with the combinatorial algorithms is gonna to have to understand the spectral ones first. Yeah, actually I was talking with a great um, computer scientist. I don't want to say the name, but actually he was mentioning that, okay, he was uh, talking to me. I said, you know, I wish you have very nice and clean, I mean, the same type of algorithm that you have like very clean algorithm. That's it. The main reason is that I don't understand complicated stuff. So if yes. I need to get it's some simple true. stuff, all right, I guess you cannot get it, which is I mean, fine essentially. That's like, no, I, I think, I do not think that I have ever been able to develop a complicated algorithm. Um, yeah. And right. that's, and that, like, I, it can I, be actually a great opportunity that. because if you know the field, you may actually come up with much nicer and cleaner algorithm. So these are for the theory ones. And, and by the way, the vertex that. version of liability, uh, network liability, uh, that also has been uh, resolved or that is open as well, the best. So uh, network liability, the last paper that I published gives an N squared time algorithm for it. Um, but I have some ideas and I'm pretty sure I think that it should be possible to get a linear time algorithm for, for approximating network reliability. Yeah. So these are some kinds of, I mean, research problem that if you are interested, I think these are nice directions. Now, what about the other more non-theory type of things? Yeah, so in practice, I would say that really everything that I'm working on is under this general vision of trying to give more power to more people to do what they want with information. So, I mean, I've been focusing on the social media and you know, squad box, let people fight harassment on their own. Uh, trust net, let people fight misinformation on their own. Uh, we have other projects. There's um, uh, Shaper, which is a project that let people access data on websites um, without programming, uh, to sort of empower people who are not programmers to make use of all of this rich data that's available on websites. Um, we have a project called Mavo. Um, this is, a, I think, a, again, a very powerful and important idea um, if you want to create your own information management tool, right? If you want to uh, manage your bibliographies or um, maintain your own website um, with, with, with rich information in it. Um, historically, you've had to be a programmer, but we've developed this tool called Mavo, which actually lets you create interactive web applications without doing any programming at all. Um, and so this, this goes into the general area that's now called um, no-code programming, uh, where there are many startups right now. Um, but I don't think they're doing it right. Um, they're trying to get you to use a particular website that they own uh, to host your applications. But Mavo is actually a, a beautiful um, extension of HTML. So if you can write HTML, uh, you add a little bit of extra... Uh, attributes to your HTML document and it suddenly turns into a functional application where you can edit data and save it um, and share it with other people um, and you don't have to do any programming at all. So it's really about just empowering regular people. I think that regular people have great ideas about information, great ideas about what they want to do with it, great ideas that they want to share with other people and the tools that exist now just get in the way and prevent them from sharing what they know, preventing that, prevent them from organizing information the way that they want. Um, and I think we can do much better uh, to, to empower them. Yeah, and something, I think this website, by the way, was 
M A V O dot I O. That's the one that Mavo. And actually, uh, that is uh, uh, very interesting. So in some sense, I mean, you try to give, I mean, uh, uh, like more power for the people for share information, of course. Nowadays, they can do it through videos, but they may want to do it maybe the website or something. And I think Mavo is the one that makes it easier. So I think you are assuming that HTML is not a programming language. So some people may consider it actually. actually yeah, so there's, there's a dispute about whether HTML is a programming language, but whether it is or not, we know that it's very easy to create visual editors for HTML, right? Yes. You can, there, there are plenty of tools that will let you edit an HTML document the way you edit. I mean, you can use Microsoft Word to create an HTML yeah. document. Right. And the point is, Mavo is of that sort. We, we have not yet created that visual editor, but you can. You can create just, just like Microsoft Word can edit HTML documents. Um, I think with some small changes, you could use Microsoft Word to also create these Mavo applications. Great. So I think we talk about like some kind. So these are like the wishes I try to summarize. Like, like this, I mean, better tool for harassment, better tool for some kind of biased ideas, prevention, essentially. This thing that the people can freely they put their ideas there essentially without even if they don't know that much programming they can easily do especially I think they can put a website as you mentioned you can create a word and put it but as long as soon as you want to also do some kind of get data process data or something then it becomes hard even reading from a database that you need to have some knowledge of this thing exactly. that's the thing but that Mavo Mav Mav saves you from all. Uh, great. So that's also one. Anything else? Oh, I could. Go, I have so many projects that could go on and on and on. But I think we've. I think we've covered a pretty nice uh, collection of them. Uh, great. Okay. So that. And I think. Uh, like. Uh, uh, that was. I mean, great thing. I think I actually mentioned to the people that they can see this talks. Also, we have the podcast version. I think it would be great to take a look at. Uh, I mean, look at this ones and the previous ones. I think these are great ideas if you want to create. A startup, I think, uh, as David uh, mentioned, all of the lots of several of these are actually the open source, so you can build on that as has been built. So it's a great idea, as I think David will be happy, <laughs> and the whole yes. community will be happier. I think just uh, one final uh, word about I mean, do you have any final word, especially I mean, for also this one, maybe I want to add it for K 12. So if you are a high schooler or maybe earlier, you want to do computer science. You, what you want to do, if you want to go to MIT, what you should do undergrad or grad, I think that's like the final things that the people will be interested in. It's an interesting question. So, you know, I, I want to be a little careful about what I say because the field has changed since I went through this experience. Um, but one thing I can emphasize is that, you know, although I was, oh, I was good at math, but I was really not anything special. Okay, like I was actually never good enough to be on the math team uh, in, in high school. Okay, um, I didn't take any college classes as a high school student, right? I was a, I was a good student in high school. I got good grades. Um, you know, like I said, I, you know, I managed to be like one year ahead in, in, in math that I, I spent my senior year just reading a calculus, an intro calculus book instead of doing trigonometry. But that was pretty much it. Um, I didn't do any of the international competitions or the computing Olympiads or anything like that. I mean, but when I started college, I don't think I'd actually written any interesting computer programs, okay? So you don't like, you don't have to be this amazing superstar genius, uh, I think. Uh, in order to, to have a successful career, uh, certainly in computer science. And I think even in academia, you, you can take your time <coughs> to, to find, your, find what you can do well. So essentially that, uh, uh, in some sense, I think this was this idea, I don't remember who was the author of the book, that said that everyone has like, I mean, uh, like the number of talents of each person is like something like around 30 and everyone has five, six of them, essentially. You only need mm -hmm. to find those things. And surely if you are technical, I think you can do math or something. If you are not technical and still you want to do that, I think you can probably 
maybe you can do some great thing in some areas. Like I think the thing that you mentioned, the algorithm was very nice and clean because I mean, you didn't want to read maybe complicated stuff and that can actually lead to that. And of course there are other fields that, I mean, you can be successful like HCI, lots of nice ideas. I mean, for me, ideas are ideas. You can solve some problem in theory, but maybe does not have a, that much application yeah. yet. HCI is a wonderful discipline for people who are interested in being technical, working with computers, but are not interested in math. I mean, HCI actually emerged from psychology. Uh, like the, the, the first researchers in HCI were psychologists, and it is still possible to have a very successful career uh, as, a social, as a psychologist or a social scientist in HCI. Great. So that's actually another uh, great thing. So I think uh, that's it. So thanks a lot for that. I think we had now almost, I mean, <laughs> two, uh, two hours and 40 minutes. I think it was yeah. a great one. I learned a lot. Hopefully others will learn. Everything will be available for everyone. I mean, to see, it. I mean, now I, I put it at like, a, uh, I think YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. So I think David, hopefully if you have a chance, you can share it. I think the people can, they can look at it like in Twitter. And that. I think that was a great yeah. thing. I see lots of learning for me, hopefully for others as well. Uh, Excellent. That's it. Thanks. Thanks for your time. And it was a great chat. Sure thing. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye.